on this episode of the podcast, um, I am joined once again by my head coach and friend, Nick Chewy Albin of Chujitsu.net. He is also the head coach at Derby City Martial Arts um, and is a black belt in Jiu-Jitsu. We um, had an idea, actually, an impromptu idea to record the podcast, actually do it on YouTube Live, so... We are um, going to record the podcast, and you guys are going to be able to check it out and watch us kind of interact with you all um, through YouTube and answer some questions that you guys send us. So it was a fun podcast. We were really silly, just kind of got on some good topics, joked around, um, really talked a lot of good jujitsu stuff and answered some awesome questions. Um, thank you guys for uh, tuning in. As always, I appreciate the support. Make sure to check out Chewy's website at chujitsu.net. Um, check out his YouTube channel, Instagram. And if you guys can, make sure to subscribe to the Jiu-Jitsu Therapist on YouTube. Um, injury prevention tips and rehab stuff on uh, jujitsutherapist.com. And make sure to leave a review on iTunes, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you and enjoy the podcast. Thanks, Chewy. And thank you to Maddie who uh, did a lot of behind-the-scenes uh, work to help the podcast run smoothly. So thanks, guys, and enjoy the podcast. You are now listening to the Jiu-Jitsu Therapist Podcast. Hey, we right, got cool. the YouTube sensation. Shut Nick up. Chewy Shut up. <laughs> I had to start have, that. Have I, ever used that? have I ever used that once? I've used it. You've used it. And, I've never... Uh, We've always, if you listen to some of the other podcasts, we try to ask Chewy what grade of jujitsu celebrity he is. D. No, I think he's moved up from like a B minus to like a B to a B plus. Oh, B plus. People usually uh, know. If you go to a tournament, people know Chewy. Do you see how he likes? This? We're, we're not. We're not talking about Chewy's YouTube. We're talking about um, stuff. We're talking about people, stuff that people might and actually be interested in yes, listening to. So. Guys, we'll just get into it. Um, actually, I wanted to have Chewy on because I've had some things going on, like some life changes, you know, babies and stuff. And, it's your fault. Uh, it is my fault. I couldn't keep it in my pants. But um, so I was kind of talking to Chewy. I've been, you know, obviously training for a while, but I was talking to Chewy about like what I feel stagnant in my game right now because I don't feel like I'm really able to focus <coughs> as much on jujitsu because my mind is so many other places. And um, we had an interesting discussion. I wanted to kind of bring that back up. And, and Chewie's kind of like, I can't help you. That's kind of what he said. That's not what I said. Kind of what he said. No, that's but. not what I said. So, go ahead. Okay, so you said you were being stagnant. Yes. And any time that you're being stagnant, I can... I, like, every time someone's ever said this to me, literally it's the same thing. It's like, okay... So what are you doing? And almost always it's like you're getting kind of in the same routine, the same ruts, kind of going through the same motions. Right. And then what I said was is you need to focus on some of the things that you need to do in your game. And, it, and it, that that's where I was like you have to do that for you because I can't tell you to like what's necessary. I mean I can give you an idea of what might be good for your game, but I can't give you the, the magic bullet, right? I can't give you the thing, oh, do this. You then have to – because you have to take the focus. You have to go out there and you have to – Find the thing that you need to work on. And then when you go to the gym, like, I can't be focused for you. You have to be focused for yourself. So I never said I couldn't help you. I said that you then, once you take whatever it is that you decide that you're going to use or work on or change, then you have to do it on your own. Yeah, and I think what you what you mentioned more than anything was um, kind of <clears throat> picking picking a topic or picking a subject or an area and kind of focusing on that. And that brought me back to when I was in school kind of how I would study. Like I would pick one thing and I'd focus on that and I'd learn that and then I'd go on to the next thing. So um, you kind of talked about something about keeping a journal or kind of setting goals before uh, going into class. Kind of, I want you to kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so like the thing that I think that's helped me out, it's helped several people that I've, I've told to do this and if they actually f you know went through with it, is to give yourself some goals because jujitsu. A lot of times you're chasing intangibles, right? It's really hard to you know put your finger on some of the things that you're doing because yeah. it's like okay, I'm getting better. What the fuck's better, right? It's it's hard to say like what better is. But if you say like well, and I use an example in my game all the time because I've done this several times. Like um, there was, and again I've used this example several times. But if I there was one time where I was working on a flower sweep, okay. basic white belt, you know one on one move flower sweep. 
I've never been able to use a flower sweep until I was a black belt. And, you know, for me, I was kind of getting kind of in the same routine. I wasn't necessarily stagnant, but I could tell that I was kind of going through the same motions. And I was like, well, I'm going to pick a move that I've never really been able to use. And it's a good move, so I should be able to. And that was the flower sweep. So from full guard, which I don't play very active full guard. I'm not very good from the full guard compared to butterfly half, those Mm -hmm. things. So I stuck to that position for over a month, but it took about two, three weeks for that sweep to actually happen. So during class, I'd be like trying to flower sweep and it just wouldn't work. And eventually my body sort of found the timing. And then where it's interesting is because then if you're focused on that thing, you have this measurable success where you go from saying, okay, I did zero of this move to now I did two, two, I did two sweeps today. I went from zero to two and then you can, you know, move up from there. And so you can see measurable success, which is motivating. And it's also a good measure to let you know, because sometimes like when we, a lot of times we don't know if we're getting better, right? We're right. like, I, I'm, I don't know what's going on, right? But if you say, I went from not being able to do this sweep to, oh, I can do the sweep, that's definitely an indication that you're actually being able to get better. Now, they can't hear very well? They're not very well on YouTube. Okay, bummer. Um, just, just... Move it closer, I don't know. Can you move it closer? I could always scoot closer to Eugene. Uh, that's fine. It's probably going to be hard. Um, <clears throat> so... What are they saying? Talking shit. I can't hear shit. Move closer to the mic. To the mic. Can you move it closer? Yeah, let's move it closer. See what we can do. If you need me to move around, just let me know. So, um, <clears throat> thanks for screwing the flow up. Well, we can't help me. Sure. No. Sorry, guys. But um, So, guys, this is like the first time. So, we're actually going to set up the DSLR at some point with it. Um, as of right now, this is just So, what does it sound like now, guys? Can you actually hear it? I, I know the sound quality is not going to be ideal because it's on an iPhone. People yelling at can us. You, can you hear us now? Is it? What is it sound? We might have to just speak louder. Just low volume. Yeah. I, All right. We'll get back from the mic a little bit. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> we'll just talk louder. Here. It's fine. Here. What if I move over this way? You can just bring it on over here. More than angle. Bring it on over. Yeah. Do what? Is it, what's that? What are they saying? Everyone's complaining. It's okay. Thanks. Is this better? Better. Is it? Is it better now, guys? Sorry. Again, the, the audio quality might be bad. This is like we sort of – we were doing the podcast anyway, and we were like, well, we'll, we'll see if we can do this live. And um, I, I thought that it would be a more simple matter to hook up the DSLR to the, the thing, but it's not as easy as it saw, thought yeah. it was going to be. Yeah. So next time we do it live, we'll, uh, we'll spruce it up a bit. Don't you touch my mic. Well, you're loud as shit. <clears throat> All right. Um, holy crap. What are they? What are they saying, Maddie? Um, you can hear fine. We can hear fine. All right, cool, perfect. So, what? How do you measure that? Like, I mean, I know you're talking about. Let's get back to learning or, or being stagnant in your, you know, techniques and stuff, and, and progressing or, or working new positions. Now, do you try those against lower belts? Do you try them against people your same skill level? I mean, initially might be easier to hit on lower belts. And then, you know, I guess if you truly have the technique down, then hitting it up people at your same skill level or better. I mean, I think you have to start off with using it against lower belts. Because, I mean, the reality is, is unless, like, for instance, it, it, honestly, I'll say this, it depends on the position. Like, if you're really good from a position, then adding a new technique into it, even if you're not really good with it, doesn't really, it's not that big of a deal. Right? Like, for instance, like, I'm pretty good from half guard. So if I found a new half guard sweep or a new half guard technique, me adding in a new one's not going to be that big of a deal. That's fine. Right? But in the example that I was given, like, against uh, the flower, or using the flower sweep, I've got a good full guard, right? But I'm not good at that that particular movement. So it took a while to to kind of get it going. And initially, I was hitting it on lower belts and working my way up. Um, but again, you have to restrict yourself, right? You know, and that's the hard part because again, a lot of times when we get rolling, we want to immediately like if that one thing doesn't work, we want to go back to our our bread and butter to get the to get the win, so to speak, right? And you that's where you have to stay really focused and disciplined. You can't go to that. You have to continue to work on that thing that you're trying to develop, and that's the hard part. Right, like you have to like get your guard passed. You have to get swept. You have to get submitted, and you just got to do it again and again and again. So, what's your what's your research process like? What do you? I mean, as far as taking notes, watching videos, uh, like how do you research a position? How do you develop it, or or kind of 
what are you looking for as far as intricacies? You know? I, mean, I mean, so I mean, there's a couple different ways you can go about this. One is to move towards your pain, right? So you move towards whatever is like bothering you, right? So I mean, you think I mean, very simply, it's like I'm getting smashed in this position. Well, you need to work there, right? So for instance, um, I used to have a lot of stro- like one of my buddies that used to train here. Um, Jason Keaton had a really good side control position, right? He was he was nasty from side control. He had really good hip pressure, and it would really frustrate me. And so, for me, like when we used to go back there on the boxing side on Sundays, back in a corner, and we would train, you know, for hours on a Sunday, and we would basically do positional rolling, basically me for, on the bottom of side control, him from my back mount because I was yeah. I was better at back, he was better at uh, escape or better at side control. So he would hold me inside, I would hold him in back. And we would repeat this process two minutes, two minutes, two minutes of just escape rounds. Submit and escape, submit and escape. And so move towards the pain. My my defense got so much better, and I feel like I can escape anybody's side control because of that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you don't move towards your pain, you can also say, well, where do you want to go, right? Because like, you know, jiu-jitsu is one of those things. It's like a choose-your-own-adventure book. Like, where do you want to go, right? You, you have it, – it's it takes time. It's not an instant thing, you know what I mean? But it's like, it's like a bodybuilder. If a bodybuilder is like, well, I want to get my chest bigger. You're going to do more like bench press. Or I want to get my legs bigger, more squats, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to have to move towards it. And it's not an instant process, but you get the ball rolling. Um, an example for me was when I was a brown belt. Like, I watched uh, Andre Gaval. You know, and he was – it was amazing to watch how much he moved – but was still playing like kind of a straightforward game that I was like, man, this is awesome, right? And I was like, I love the movement. And so I was like, well, I want to move in a, in a much better way than I do right now because at the time I was a brown belt, I, was, I moved like a big guy. I was like, put the pressure on. So I was like, I want to move more. And so you can see now that I got move all over the place. Yeah. And that was done purposely. I, I started doing a lot of different drills and a lot of movement um, drills and things like that, both, both with partner and solo, to develop that ability for those hips to turn over and for me to bounce around from place to place. Um, and so that was kind of like, you can, so you can go that way as far as how to research it, man, you can look at people for like the same body type as you, you can say, man, like his body type looks similar to mine. That might work for you. Um, that's something I've always recommended people. Cause again, you know, if you've got like little short stubby legs, you know, watching a guy who's got like, you know, really long legs probably isn't going to be the best person for you to watch. You might enjoy their style and yeah. you, I'm sure they have stuff to show you, but as far as you mimicking their styles, probably not going to be the best way to go. Finding someone that's going to be kind of your same build probably could be a good measure or at least a good starting place. And then sometimes, man, like you can just go down the rabbit hole and watch videos and watch instructionals and just wait till something speaks to you. You know, and then again, when you decide that you're going to grab onto a move or a position or whatever, you got to do it for at least a month. You know, you, and you have to stick to it. You know, you can't just like run away from it the first time something doesn't go well. You got to like stick there and really, you know, wait it out. So, what about like rep wise? I mean, how many? What's a good number of reps in a in a in a training session? Like, what's too much? What's not enough? You yeah. can't get enough reps. Okay. Like, but basic like repetitions, man. I don't think you can get enough reps. Um, I think that it's you know in a regular training session where you're you, where you've got maybe like a two hour class or an hour class. You know, I mean, just train as much as you can. Stay focused. A lot of times people, like, I, even in our classes, right, like, a lot of times the reason why I do timer instead of um, number of reps is because people say, well, I hit my number of reps, and then I fuck off. Yeah. Right? Like, okay, I hit the I hit the objective. Now I'll just kind of mess around. So if we say three minutes, well, then you just know you're moving through three minutes. But if I say, like, all right, guys, give me ten reps, and then just keep going back and forth, you might both hit your ten reps right off the bat, and then afterwards – you're like, well, I did my 10 reps. You start go, goofing off a little bit, and you don't put that same focus on it. So I think that one of the things in a class is to stay focused. Now, as far as reps go, um, you know, something I did, it was kind of an interesting experiment, was I would take, uh, when I did private lessons back then, I used to do a lot, um, we would take, uh, I would take a journal, and we would count the reps that people would do. And I, I did it as just sort of my own curiosity, right? Like, I, I, there was no purpose to it, but I would give someone a move, and we would drill this move, rep it, rep it, rep it, rep it, rep it. And we found like that right around between 750 and about a thousand, man. That's where you see that move really like just fine. Like it just comes out of nowhere, Damn. right? Like where basically it's become so fast, you know. I mean, again, and that's not that. That's not that much, really. Like you can knock out easily, can knock out a couple hundred reps, you know, within you know 30 minutes if you stay focused, yeah. right? And that's the thing. People a lot of times there's a there were there's a several books on it, but deliberate fo- deliberate training, right? Deliberate practice. Where you're not just going through the motions with your brain dead, right? It, it's tough. It's like a musician if they're playing a particular part of a song that they're having trouble with, they play that song over and over right. and over again, and it, to the point where it's monotonous and it's not fun anymore. 
but it's very like it has a, it, that training has purpose to it and that has a point. And so sometimes with your training, if you really want to take it to the next level, you got to come in and do some drilling and you got to do some reps. And it has to be to the point where it may be, you know, it, it's not that it's not fun because you feel really good after you've done your reps because you know right. it's going to like find its way into your game, but it's not as fun as just like, all right, like here's 10 reps, now let's go roll. You know what I mean? Like it, it, to me, I would like I would rather focus more days like drilling and a little bit less rolling sometimes. I think that's because I've actually experienced more benefit for myself from that. Is that like um, <clears throat> since you have been doing some seminars and stuff? Is that something that like you feel like your teaching style has it changed or evolved at all? Like since you've kind of made some rounds, some of the, you know surrounding states. Do you feel like you've adjusted um, how? how you teach moves or how you, you mean kinda, like have I adjusted my t- style of teaching yeah. since I started doing seminars just yeah have you learned anything from doing seminars like do, I mean does right learn the same way is there certain things you found more effective I mean nobody learns so I mean, it, it's almost like you gotta come in there every every you'll find this if you go around to different gyms every gym has like a, a vibe to it you know what I mean? Like every gym you go into, I mean, like you literally, like you, and it typically starts with like the head guy, right? Like you, okay. you go in there and you can meet them and you can almost guarantee who, who, who the rest of the people that are going to be there. Um, you know, even Jess and I were talking about that, like, oh man, this gym, like you, these, you know, they all kind of like have this a, a different vibe, each one, you know? Um, as far as teaching goes, I mean, you just have to be aware and in the moment. I, my, my teaching style is so hands on. If you ever go to a seminar with me, like, or if you, see, if you see me teach when I'm here, I'm running around the place, like right. moving people around and talking to people, trying to engage with people one-on-one. You know what I mean? I try to keep the – and I, I don't really change that very much. Like I, I engage my uh, – or I do the moves very as quick as possible with the instruction. Mm-hmm. I don't like to go drone over details too much too too quickly just because I think sometimes it can people can zonk out. So I'd rather get people moving and then immediately I'll go around and move people around and, and put their body into place and have that one-on-one engagement with them rather than just like have like a 20-minute detail of a move and then like back off and just let them go. You so know? what do you what do you like teaching when you go to seminars? Are you teaching like your, your A game? My your, like what, what, what do you like to teach? What can people expect? Depends. My A game. It, like for instance, like we went – I've done a couple of seminars recently and what I've been trying to show and what I've shown every time at every seminar is like the system that I use, like the process. Right. I, I think like everybody develops a system over time. You whether you know it or not, you just do just by like sort of by trial and error, right? Okay. Your body moves towards certain areas uh, of jiu-jitsu just because it works. You know, and then you like let's say you end up doing half guard. Man, my half guard is working for me. Well, you're probably going to go there again because you're like it feels good to win. Right. You know, it feels good to get to, to be successful. So you keep going there. And then the more you're there, the more you start to sort of figure out what the common responses are. Because a lot of times there's like a handful of common responses to most positions, yeah. most techniques and things like that. And then you have these responses where you go, I gotta do, if I do this, I do this. And if they do this, I do this. And then you have a system built and it happens over time. And so for me, like a lot of times what I do is when I go to seminars, I don't want to just show stuff. I, I'm not there to like, hey guys, watch me do something that's really popular in Vogue. It's like, I want to show you something that works for me. And I want to show it to you in a systematic process that I use. So this way, hopefully... If you came to the seminar, like it wasn't just like, oh, it looks really cool. Well, were you able to use anything? No, I, I, didn't, I couldn't use anything, right? I wanted to be like, man, like it didn't look that cool, but man, everything worked. Yeah. I would rather have that. It right? linked together almost. Everything kind of built off each other. Exactly, and that's the way. Like when I teach, like I like in a, in a in a seminar, right? Like it's all about like we start here, and I try to link from A to B. So this, or you know, this way, like you know, or actually A to Z rather, right? Because we're trying to go to the end. Well, A to B, A to C doesn't matter really. A to Z. We're going somewhere. From one point to the other, right? Gotcha. To, to yeah. start to finish. And so when, I, when I'm doing that, I'm trying to do that. So this way, when people are like going there, they can either take the whole thing by itself, like wholesale. They can just take, I want to do all this stuff. Or they can say, well, I know where you started. I know what the end of de- destination was. And you can kind of pick and choose what you want out of that, that you know, there. But you understand why I was going from here to here and what the point was. What's, what's a good amount like to teach? I mean, how many moves, how many different positions? Like, I mean, before you kind of zone out mm-hmm. everybody's different everybody's different i mean like um a handful yeah you know I mean, if you go to a seminar and somebody's just like showing you a hundred moves you may you're not get rem- none you're not gonna remember if anything. You, they show you like three you might get you know one i mean because yeah. i think the difference is in the detail when you look at black belt title black belt you said like you never hit a flower sweep or something until you're a black belt so it's like that's a pretty basic close yeah. guard sweep and like when you look at the black belts compete they're doing a lot of the Simple, basic techniques. There's very some very do, good at. some do some more. Yeah. It's all over the place, That's you true. know. Sure. But I mean, yeah. You, I mean, the thing is, you don't have to go that way. You don't have to do all the crazy stuff. You watch plenty of black belts that do super basic stuff. Yeah. You know that that you like. Man, I, I learned that when I was a white belt. 
Yeah, he did, but he just does it better. Yeah. You know? Um, as far as how many t- techniques to show, everybody's different. But, I again, I try to keep it, like, short and sweet. Because um, I, I think that, like, for me personally, one of the um, most impactful experiences that I've ever had, um, the handful that I can think of, have all been in situations where I was only showed a few things. Right. right? Like, one time, like, Hanato, I talked about this half guard. He did a half guard class on a Friday. It wasn't even a seminar. I don't remember anything from the seminar, but the class that was awesome. It was an hour class. He showed three half guard techniques, and I remember every single one of them. And I've very like I've created variations for my own game. I yeah. still use them to this day. Uh, Sean Hammond's my current coach now, man. Like I would go down and train with him in um, uh, down in uh, Nashville mm-hmm. back in the day. I would I would leave here Thursday morning, usually around like six a.m. I'd drive down there, go train. I'd come back here afterwards and train here. And when I would go train during his competition training class we would only do usually one move one maybe two moves and we just drill it and i remember that was when i learned how to do the mule kick pass that that big kick out pass from the standing position Mm -hmm. i learned it from him and i remember it was like we did you know like a bunch of reps down there like we 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 did that one move for like several rounds of two minutes at a two minutes pop and i remember i came back man and i was just like dude this is awesome yeah well i started repping it more and more and more in the class and i started hitting it on people you know but again like that was like one of those things where that pass became one of my staples it what like it wasn't he didn't show me any, everything crazy he was just like oh here's this one really simple move you can just add to your game right now yeah it's crazy how like things just like for some people just click like you know certain moves like you know mm-hmm. butterfly or half guard whatever like I get you know obviously loop choke is my thing I don't know why like I don't know how I developed Anatomy. that it just what well, just happened I just like I think I found myself there and I kept finding myself there and it's hard to get away from what works and that's the thing like I think we were also talking about um, kind of the whole feelings of like you don't want to you want to make sure that your your belt like you represent your belt well like you right. don't want to lose to a lower belt you don't want to get submit like what are people going to think yeah. what are your training partners going to think yeah. what's your coach going to think and that brings me up to the point we'll talk about that but that brings up to the point that there was that whole video on that green belt I didn't that. see it. Okay, so there was like a a tournament where I guess jujitsu.net or something. There's okay. a whole so it was a tournament basically um no no level everybody could compete okay and so a green belt 13 year old green belt beat like a pretty legit i think brown belt okay um and so like and that's just making you know huge you know like look at chad when chad went against the black belt. i don't know how good he was but chad was a purple belt chad, i mean Ch- chad uh, chad actually you know i know that you're thinking about the big one but yeah. I, i'm not gonna say his name all like right now but chad actually beat a legit like friggin' super legit purple belt or uh, excuse me, black belt when he was a purple belt. Right, and, yeah. and but what does that what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. What does that mean to the black belt? What does it mean to his team? And, and that goes back to people not wanting to work positions they're not good at yeah. because like your easiest but way that's, to win. Fear. Yeah, but, but it's, it's also thinking about what people. What see, are people going to think of? But who gives a shit what people think? See, this is fear. This is the ego. Yeah. Right. This is the ego. It's like, there. That, what, it's ego. Exactly. And see, this is the thing where like you have to. Like, for instance, I, I was listening on, like, or I was looking at one of the comments I had recently, and the person was, like, talking about, like, these bullshit jiu-jitsu gyms and, like, no, like, how, the, how we have no values or whatever. It, like, you know, because traditional gyms, everybody's bowing and doing this traditional stuff, which is fine. It's, it's fine. It's, it's a ritual, whatever. But, like, this to me is, like, the beautiful part about jiu-jitsu because, like, it's real. Right, yeah. like the, the, you're having that real fear, and it's being extracted from you, and then you have to actually be introspective enough to look back at yourself and be like, you're fucking up. Like, because, again, it's just an ego thing. You know, because, again, what is, a, to me, like, what is a, a purple belt to black belt? Honestly, man, in a lot of cases, like, purple belts can compete with black belts just fine. As far as, like, the level of competition, a lot of times they're good enough um, to compete with average level black belts. Now, you put a, a high-level purple belt against, like, upper echelon of black belt, he's getting crushed. But in a lot of cases, purple belts can be competitive, yeah. right? To me, it comes down to more, like, there's, there's a certain aspect of time. You know, like time in it. Like, for instance, like here's a great example of Chad. When Chad was in here as a purple belt, I watched him submit black belts in tournaments, right? Not just the big guy that he had, but multiple. Mm-hmm. I watched him just beat the brakes off of brown belts and black belts in training, right? Doesn't mean that they're not superb instructors. It doesn't mean that they weren't winning tournaments themselves. You know, it's just competition. And Chad's a competitor, right? He's an athlete. Now, the one thing that Chad was doing wrong when he was a blue belt at that time, though, he was, he was, he, his ego had gotten so good because he was so good at, at, right. at that age. Like, when he would come in, like, he would smash guys, right? And he would just, like, everybody was on the mat. He was crushing everyone. You remember this, right? Mm-hmm. And I remember having a conversation with him, man, and just kind of telling him, like, remember, if you're the coach, you're in it for them. You're here to serve these people. 
And man, to to really to hats off to Chad for his maturity at that age because he was like sure. 16 years old. He flipped it around, man, and he was like on the mats, like let me get you, let me build you guys up, like let me build you guys up. Yeah. And so to me, like that's kind of another step of it because you as a black belt, man, like again, there's such a like once you get to black belt, it's such a wide array. Like every belt anyway, there's such a wide range of like skill levels depending on gym to gym. There's not there's not a lot of standardization to it, right? So the, every gym's got a different expectation of what it is. But to me, the difference between purple belt purple belt, you're starting to specialize, right? right. So you've probably got some positions you can probably win with, right? Um, should someone get you in there, right? You probably like as a purple belt, you've got a black belt position somewhere, sure, right? Like Rich, Rich like Rich, one of our guys, um, when he was a when purple belt man, he had a slick triangle. Yeah, if you, sure. if, 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 he, if he got anybody there, there was a chance you could lose. Now you, there were other positions that weren't rounded out yet, um, but you know then when you get into brown belt man, you're you're moving in towards that. You're now going from you know just pure like you know training and whatever you're now starting to, to refine your style and then as you get into brown belt or your black belt it starts over again and to right. me as a black belt then you become more of a you, you're you should be able to teach you should be able to build other people up and, and you should have like a different knowledge of the teaching game rather than just simply how to train hard how to go hard how to you know go after it right right and to me it's, it's a different thing like I, w- I would not promote someone for instance like if they're to a black belt if they were like shitheads you know or if they didn't have everybody's like you know best interest we got some funny comments Oh, what's Adam saying? What's Adam saying? He said, uh, man, who's the camera lady they hired? She needs to step up her game. <laughs> That's Maddie, dude. That's Maddie. Thanks, She's Adam. awesome. Mm. So, yeah. So, anyway. The, yeah, um, dude, it's, it's such an ego. It's ego There's thing. such an ego thing. For me, personally, like, I'll beat myself up if I get, you know, submitted. And, but like I said, because, man, you feel like you're, you know, first of all, nobody likes to lose. Right. Nobody likes to lose. And, and also, you're like, well, Am I, am I worthy of this level that I'm at? Am let, me ask, I, let me ask you a question. Have you submitted me before? I'm sure I have, but I don't know if it was... Okay. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Have, I mean, <laughs> but, you let me. What, but what I'm saying is... is like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, Probably. Like, like I, you've submitted me before I was working on stuff. You've swept yeah. me before. You've passed my guard before. There's been things where like I'm trying stuff out and you're getting me, right? Um, so What? Like I used to have that problem too, yeah. and the only reason I can talk about it and like like this is because I've been there before. It still happens, man. Like I, I'll still every now and then like, I'll be doing something, and then I'll feel this like, like, like you know I can feel this like this this feeling come up in my chest where I'm like almost pissed that like someone who's under me right is doing something. I'm like, yeah, and then it, immediately I catch it. I'm like, shut up, like back down. You know what I mean? Get it's rid hard, of it, man. It, well, I think that once you're a black belt, you kind of have achieved a certain level. I, I feel like. Because everybody's, I don't know, people chase belts too. It's crazy. Like, I don't know, I, like, I never, like, honestly, like, I tried to savor each belt. Like, I tried to um, enjoy it. Like, I was like, I liked being, you know, the belt I was at because I was like, it's less pressure. And, yeah. and I loved having less pressure. And I like, because sometimes you're not on. But the, yeah, but the pressure, again, it, it, you have to just understand the pressure is always like, we know this, but the pressure is just on you. You put it there. Yeah. Because the pressure is, the, 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 like, when you break it down, like, like again, it's just like like literally you tapping is just you you tapping a mat. Yeah, like it, it, it's nothing. It's like that's it's physically it, what it is. It, it, but, that's but physically mentally, what it is. And mentally, it's more than that. Different. But again, it, but those emotions are they become from your perception though, and the only reason it means anything is because you make it mean something. And if and if like you and you have to kind of allow yourself. So if you're gonna like play a different game. If you're gonna work with some different stuff, you gotta like be like, I am okay. Like you gotta like literally like when you walk on the mat that day, you have to be like, I'm okay with getting submitted today. I'm yeah. okay with getting trashed today. I'm okay with that. And a beautiful, beautiful thing happens when you kind of like remove that from it. You get this cool like, and I know this sounds freaking weird. Like there's moments where like, especially like when I'm working on weird stuff like or that's not part of my game, I'll go on the mat and I literally like, I'm not here to win today. I'm not here to lose. I'm just here and I'm gonna see what happens. Like because I want to work on some new stuff and I'll get in these these weird like rhythms man like where it's like my my brain's just it's almost like meditation like where your brain's just empty and you're just moving with emotions and i'll like pull out some weird stuff man like it's been some of my best training sessions where like i'm not there to win i'm not there to lose it's like i get like just clear-headed um you know the uh in judo and, and in you know japanese stuff like right they talk about uh was it like uh mind no mind right it has a they have a name obviously a direct you said that was, it's, yeah, but mind no mind right like no mind like clear your head you know get rid of all this stuff you're you're not worried about the end of the match Right where you lost or where you won, you're not worried about like 
the, you know, that person's game. You're not worried about what you're going to, you're literally just worried about what am I doing right now? Like what's going on in this very moment with the person. And when you can get into that, dude, that's where like some, you'll have some cool training sessions cause you'll start being able to think on the fly and just do some really cool stuff. But that doesn't happen if you're letting your ego get in the way right. because you're like, I'm worried about winning. I'm worried about well, losing. I think you, I don't know, like being competitive, you have that kind of competitive edge on, there's always something about winning, you know? Mm. It's like nobody wants to be a loser. Nobody wants to be. Nobody wants to get fucking tapped all the nope. time, you know. Mm-hmm. And there's something about you know knowing that you got the better end, or the you know. Yeah, the, I get it. The, there's something about. There's, I know. That's why we do jujitsu because like of the way it makes us feel. Yeah. Like shit, dude. You know, it's not fun to, to get your ass beat. So like sometimes being a white belt's tough because you get. Get right up and see and, and what's happened now is, is you're a brown belt so you climbed your way up this damn totem pole and you're sitting on the top pretty pretty high and you're like it feels good up here yeah i don't want to have to go back to like if i change my game up a little bit i don't want to have to go back down to here where it's like oh man like i'm getting submitted again this that's, sucks that's how you grow though you know it is how you grow i mean you, you, you know the cre- like you have to put yourself there was a cool quote um by i think it was from carl young he was talking about like um, i don't have the quote on me right now it's on my phone sure reads entirely um, too much but but basically it was a, it was a quote about like cre- like you know like creativity creativity a lot of times comes out of necessity okay. right and so it, you know people are like well, I'm not creative well, you'll be creative if you fucking put yourself into a spot yeah. where you have to be creative, right? So what you do is you say, look, like for instance, I think one of the best ways to like mix it up and get rid of the stagnation, kind of going back to it, and like talking about this situation you're saying is like go to the position that you're that you suck from, find your worst one, and just go, or right? just go there, and then like put yourself there as much as possible, and force yourself to play from there, and you'll be amazed at like what happens because when you commit to that 100, percent like you know the stuff will come up like you won't be thinking about it because it comes from the subconscious first yeah right you'll be like stuff will come up out of nowhere and you'll be like man like all of a sudden i started doing this one grip and i don't know why i did it i started going for the loop choke. i don't know why i started going yeah. for it you know what i mean because you end up you just end up there and what do so you, what do you say if you're i don't even know if i'm a topic I'm all so over the place no this is good and i kind of want to ask you as a coach and your you know your student is that brown belt or whoever, and he gets submitted by that green belt. What do you say to him? What do, What do you say? How do you approach it? You treat You treat it like any other situation. What do you do? You went to a tournament. You got submitted. Let's look at what you did wrong and fix it. I mean, what are you going to say? Oh, you shouldn't have got submitted. Man, that's that's the roll of the dice, dude. Like, because I mean, you know, that kid could be some friggin' phenom, probably. And you and you got caught. I don't. How do you get submitted? Do you know? Uh arm bar maybe okay so like let, let's see. i don't know you maybe you got caught in a weird spot you got caught in like a weird spot maybe this kid's so good like literally this kid has been just repping out arm bars right, all day long right. and he's got this amazing arm bar who knows right For but sure. you got smith so what like get what are you you're gonna quit you're gonna fucking quit now like i mean what are you gonna do you, you're gonna you're gonna go forward because that's what you're supposed to do so we yeah. fucking we look at you what you did wrong fix it move on yeah. i mean there's nothing you can do you know, I mean, like, what are you going to say? Like, because you, you're not going to quit. I mean, it, it, I, you know, I don't even like, again, it's, it's the thing about competition. Like, for instance, I remember as a white belt, I beat a purple belt, you know, dude was tough. He like won, like, he took second in the blue as a blue belt in the pans that year. And then I went against him and I didn't know anything. I was literally, I was at the Arnold's and I was walking around. This is back in the day where they would combine white to purple belts. It was like an amateur division. Combine them. Yeah. It was, it was in, it was in Nogi, right? <laughs> so I'd been training like six months at the time, right? So I'm walking around all these different guys and like they're like, How long have you been trained? Two years, four years, six years, ten years, right? I'm like, shit, I'm I'm outclassed, man. So I go up against the guy who's been trained for six years, six months, right? And so I I was wearing a singlet, by the way, like a wrestling singlet. Oh. And uh so I'm like wearing my little little spandex onesie. And so I get in there and you know, I mean, this dude like he uh, like I said, he took second at the pans as a blue belt, and now he's a purple belt. And I beat him. I beat him like I think I want to say like six to two or something yeah. like, and again like, I've seen him at tournaments afterwards. Like I mean he he didn't stop training, like he lost to a white belt. He was a purple belt, decorated purple belt, decorated blue belt, yeah. decorated purple belt. I mean he lost to me. What are you gonna say? Like I mean doesn't I mean it just it happens, happens, man. It happens and in sure. com- competition's not the same as like. Not overall knowledge. It's not even the same as in training, man. It's a different environment, dude. Like you know that's why you can watch uh, wrestlers come in and do some crazy stuff. Yeah. I I, hell, I had a. I had a white belt come in here one time, or one of our white belts, uh, a brown belt came in here from another from another gym uh, out of uh, out of the city, and he came in one time uh, just for a class. And I knew that he was a brown belt, but I didn't tell anybody he was a brown belt. So I was like, "Hey guys, welcome! Make him feel welcome, that kind of thing." And I watched him roll, and it was funny because one of our a couple of our white belts did really well with him, right? right? And you know, like, yeah, and like 
after I was like, hey, by the way, he's a he's a brown belt, and they didn't know. Like if if I had told them it was a brown, they they might have been like. Oh, you know, been kind of yeah. like scared. You to roll go for different. Stuff. You, you do roll, roll different because you're because you're scared. Like, oh, are they giving me something or like right. you know whatever? But I don't know, man. Like, it's the whole mental. That's a, such a mental. Yeah, but that's a long winded answer to saying I would have just told the guy just keep training and we'll figure out what you did wrong, fix it. You know, whatever. You know, there's so many variables. There's so many things could go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what's you know, and I just think like, what's the advantage of you know going in a tournament where there's people that are green belts or which is like a upper level white belt really what's the advantage of being a brown belt and you you it's like high risk low reward you know you get caught or you lose like what what i mean i don't know if there's money involved or what i don't know but uh it's just it's it is, crazy it is what it is man it's crazy to me like i, I don't know like it, it's something i think it it does say something on the end of the person that's competing as a lower belt too because you're putting a lot on the line yeah you're putting a lot on the line i think you're you know you're you know like, do you deserve to be there? I mean, of course. Yeah, I mean, I think for most schools, most schools, I think, you know, they don't just give away belts. At least I hope they don't, you know. But I think there may be more of a problem. What's up? She's, she's um, just So, just go here a bit. Chewy, like, I, I did know, like, what's your training been? Like, have you kind of backed off a little bit on training? What have you been doing? Because I know you're taking some days, kind of lighter days now, yeah. starting to do some lighter days. I've been... Somebody's got some got some loud speakers. Um, I mean, I've been kind of I've been lazy recently. I've got a I've had a bunch of stuff going on um, business wise, right? Like business business wise, doing some things. You know, everybody's got a role to play. You know what I mean? And I think that you got to really honor that. You know, like in for me recently, it's not been to compete. Like this this past year, I really haven't competed much. You know, last year I competed a good amount. This year I really haven't competed that much, and it's because. I've got some things that I want to do that will then put in place possibilities for all the guys here to come up afterwards that they that they will have that I did not have. And the only way I can make those happen is if I do what I'm supposed to do. Right? Like I you know again like in my position here like I we have competitors and I still compete from time to time and I enjoy it, but my sort of I feel like my position right now is not simply just to be competing all the time because I think that if I do that then I, I will lose the, the chances the opportunities that I have in place right now okay. with, a few, with a few things and I can do a lot of cool stuff you know not just for me but for all the all the young guys that come into the gym that like you know like one, one of the coolest things for me is to like every now and then like like where I can sponsor people like or whether like whether again, I don't talk about it like but I'll like hey man I'll come to someone who needs it like hey man I got you for this tournament don't worry about it like, you know what I mean? Okay, cool, thanks, Chewie. Yeah, no problem. Or, hey, guys, if you can get down there, I'll pay for this, that, whatever. Like, you know, I'll be able to take care of things. You know, I love being able to do that stuff, and I want to do more of it. And I want to be able to, like, take guys and give them chances. Because when I was when I first started, I was broke, super poor. I made just enough money to get to the gym and, like, pay for the dues. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, I didn't, and a lot of times, I didn't have the chance to compete all the time because I didn't have the money. And so I'd love the chance to be able to, like, give more guys the chance to compete. But that takes money and that has to put certain business things into place to make those possible. And so I feel like my, my, cha- my goal right now, my position, my place, is to not simply just continue to compete and build up my own name, but also to, um, you know, build all those people up around me in some way, you know, in, in different ways. So, you have anything like on the horizon? Anything you're thinking about? Any uh, tournaments or any? Because you just did that. Uh, what was that fight to win? In that was, also, that was like uh, March or March or April. So yeah. that was the last time you competed. I competed. I think I competed at Ego afterwards just for fun. Did you? Yeah, I competed up against the big guy. That's right. That's yeah. right. You did. So like, I mean, that was like a last minute thing. Like literally, like we we didn't really know. We were just like, yeah, yeah it was let's like do a it. Open class, right? Yeah, no, yeah, no. yeah. Well, what like what do you think? I mean, is there anything you you want to do? Is there any any shows that you and any rule sets? Let's talk about this too. What rule sets do you prefer? Like, do you like... I really like the fight to win rule set. I like the idea of, like, look, you got X amount of minutes, friggin' roll, get after it, and then afterwards we're going to decide who's going to be a winner and a loser. I think that's... To me, like, because there's, like, the rule set where you have, like, a submission only, and then, you know, no one wins. If it's a draw, that sucks, because then, you know, there's not a good enough, sometimes, carrot or stick... To, yeah, to yeah. sort of get people moving for that submission. You know, and, and a lot of times talk about stuff on the line, right? If you're at these big tournaments and you've got a big name for yourself, man, like you don't want to like possibly lose to someone and then like, you know, hurt your reputation. Even though if you go after it, nobody's going to look at you negatively. They're going to be like, man, like, I mean, if you look at every great competitor, every one of them's lost. 
But you don't you don't you don't care about it because a lot of the great competitors the reason you, the reason you remember them is because of their performances whether it's their win or their losses you're like man they were always going after it right um, and then you know as far as like the the I, you know the EBI rules are cool the only thing I don't like about it is because there's sometimes where you'll get guys that don't do anything until the the overtime rounds where like you'll they'll stall out they'll just kind of like conserve as much energy as possible and then all right now we're in the, that that overtime round and then they'll come alive I'm like why didn't you do that the first ten minutes you know, to me, like, you know, I used to be like a a guy that would play for points and play for just to win, and then I got so disgusted with myself because I'm like, I'm not who I am. Like, I, I like I'm I'm so gripped by the fear of losing that I'm not really I'm not doing what I would like to do. So I'm like, screw that. I'm not going to worry about winning and losing. I'm going to go out there and be more focused on let me hit my moves. Let me let me let me display my style. You know, it's like it's like almost like if I was a if I was an artist, like a painter, right? Or like mm-hmm. you work so hard on this art. And then when you go to the gallery, you're just like giving people a sneak peek of it. Like you're like lifting up half the half the little the little can, uh, the little covering or something, right? You're, you can only see part of it. Yeah. Like I want to rip that thing off and show everybody the whole thing if I'm going to compete. Like if I'm going to compete, I want to want you to see everything that I have in my friggin' wheel wheelhouse. And if I win, I win. If I lose, I lose. Whatever. But that's not my goal. My goal is to put put on my 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 display for my style. And a lot of times I find that if I do that, I win. Very, you know, I win because I'm going after it. I'm not worried about winning and losing. I'm worried about like doing my stuff. Yeah. Right. And then, so that's why I think that I really like the fight to win rules, where it's basically, like, look, man, go, just go for it. You know, like you're you're at least going to be dominant position, right? You're going to go for it and try to go for the finish and just go. And at the win, like one of you guys is going to win, one of you guys is going to lose. There is no, there is nothing else. Yeah. So go, right? Like, and to me, I, I like that idea because it's. To me, that's that's just a, it's a good style. Yeah, we talked for about, me personally. We know. talked about the IBJJF and uh, with a couple of our guys competing in the Master Worlds. Got that train coming. Train, choo choo. It's like my videos. Um, boop, boop. Never dismissing the ambulance. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we had a couple of our guys compete in Master Worlds. Uh, Justin is the world champ of getting DQ'd a purple belt. Yeah. In the mess. So he's got DQ'd again. It not, was a sign. He's not meant to be a purple belt. He's meant um, to be a brown belt. <laughs> yeah, he needs he to go for knee bars and moves. shit. Um, man, like, and, and so we look back at the video for that, and the guy, in theory, and we don't know this, because he kind of winked at his coach or whatever. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, we don't, we can speculate, but like, I mean, what's the, is there honor? Honestly, like, we know we talked about this, but, like, honestly... Like, win, like winning by win, DQ? Win by DQ, but you're not winning by DQ because somebody did something illegal. You're kind of baiting them into a position and then looking at the ref to get bailed out. And again, I, I like, know. you know, and again, I can't say from, th- like, watching the video when I was well, watching, I was like... watched it, and... When I watched it, and again, like, he, he winks the coach. Yeah, yeah. And, and the fact that it happened in the next match, and that, like, one of the guys that Justin had gone against for said, hey, man, this happened to me, too, with a guy... Maybe maybe he purposely puts himself into DQ positions or, or weird positions for his belt. I don't know, um, but for me, like I would not be satisfied with like a DQ win. I would not say I beat someone. It, like if I got a DQ win, I would not say oh, I'll beat that guy. I'd be like, nah, man. Like we got tangled up and like you know something happened, right? Like uh, or and, like same thing with an advantage. I wouldn't. I'm never satisfied with an advantage win. Advantage wins suck. Like to me, it's like it's like you almost did something. Good for you. Like well, it sucks. Would you do anything like as far as the like the rule set for IBJJF? Like I mean, it doesn't matter. Would what you I restart? Do. Like would you restart? I mean, it, no. I would just like like to me. It's like once you DQ people left and right. Well, I mean, to me, it's like well, the thing about the the only thing I I, I, I love the organizational right. skills. Right, really well like, done. Yeah, it's like prestigious. They they. Perceive prestige, right? Yeah. Um, they they've developed a really good organizational system, right? Like when you go to a tournament, you know it's going to run. You know when you're going to be on. They they run a smooth tournament. The problem that I have, like I think with IBJF, I mean, it's like the rules are so friggin' inconsistent. Like like nobody like you can watch you can watch like on, on a day, and there's so many like and I, we have so many examples. Like the wor- the worst one, honestly, to me as far as DQs on our team was probably Chad. Where Chad was like playing a half guard position, like he literally, like he was on his side, one leg was under, and the other foot was up on his hip, and they called him for reaping, and the guy was going for a cut through pass, and we're like, what the, what the, what do you mean a cut through or a, a knee reap, right? Like, and so to me, but then like, and then there was even one time where Chad put a guy in a locked, fully locked triangle, he's squeezing, yeah. and this guy drags him out of bounds. That's supposed to be a DQ. You're not supposed to be able to evade the the submission, right? But you know what happens? 
They go, oh, restart back on the feet. Restart back on the feet. What the fuck are you doing, right? Like, like, it, and there's no consistency among that kind of stuff. And that's the thing that frustrates me. With the, the because that it's, was IBJJF. They yeah, restarted be, him on the feet. Yeah, they restarted him on the feet after he ran his way out of a at, while he's caught in a fully locked, sunken triangle, like ready to finish, and he runs out. And it was so frustrating because you know, to me again, that's where I get frustrated with it because. It's one thing if you get caught in a bad position you weren't supposed to be in, fine, happens. But it's another thing when, like, you're having someone not, you know, go by the rules. And, and then again, like, when there's inconsistency amongst everything where you're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And where, like, literally, like, there's sometimes where you can look like, oh, like, you know, this particular ref does this, this one does this. It just, it sucks. Like, and I think they should just get rid of, get, get less rules and just let them go. You know what I mean? Like, again, because it's like adding in all this weird stuff. To me, it's like, for instance, like Knee Reap, right? Right. If you're a black belt dude and you don't know how to defend an e-reap, then, like, you probably should give your black belt up. Like, it's it's a simple thing. Like, it happens sometimes. P- prevent it. Like, e- we could knee-reap as white belts back in the day. No right. one said anything to us. I remember back in the day, the big thing that everybody was, was friggin' crazy about wasn't even a hill. It was a neck crank. Yeah, neck like, crank was the because all the wrestlers would come in. That was like the big, the big like taboo can, submission. Can, opener. can openers. That was a taboo submission back in the day. It was like, oh, you can't yeah. do the can't do the ta- uh, the, uh, the can opener. You know, when I had uh, James Klingerman on my podcast, who runs the the Ego, yeah, and he said they allow knee reaping, and yeah. he said they've never had an injury from knee. Re- they've had other injuries, but knee reaping was never the cause mm. or the reason for an injury, mm. and so like. I, I mean, I don't know. Like any any position, like I, any position, could be dangerous. You know what I mean? Jiu is dangerous. Yeah, man. I mean, we're you, not you, playing patty cake. Yeah, you know what any, I mean? Like any position. I mean, shit, dude. You can dislocate somebody's shoulder, elbow. You can tear the rotator cuff. I mean, you can do all that shit. Yeah. It, it's it's just, I guess, I, I don't know. Like I said, I, I, I'm I'm the thing about it is, is I just wish it was more consistent across the board because they run such a good tournament. They do, yeah. It's run, it's run so like organizationally wise, and and the way that they run it, you get such good competition. It's run so smoothly. It's a beautiful tournament. It's just frustrating when like matches are decided with that kind of stuff where you're like, yeah. man, what was this? You know what I mean? Like, and I, I, I think also, I think advantage, the of advantages and they should have overtimes. Like, I don't think ever you should have like, to me, it's so anti, like just climactic to have a big black belt final or a big, like in a beautiful match where both guys are going back and forth, back and forth. And then it ends up where they have like a, like a, a ref has to make that decision. I think the, the, the I think the competitors should be able to say, no, we, we got like first per, first person to score, like right. here we go, sudden death, boom, let's go, you know, or another two minutes or something, and whoever wins, I mean, yeah. something to like let's let's decide, let the competitors decide it, man. You know, I mean, like because you know, the, to me that would be way way more like yes, okay, we're we're, we're actually going to see who wins, you know, not like who got their who got the head nod because again, that's so subjective, and again, it's like you know that to me it's like. Eh, well, and what do you give advantages for? Do you give an advantage for somebody in closed guard that are just fighting for grips? Yeah. Do you give advantage, or do you give them well, a stalling? That, beca- that becomes that's, well, well, that's where it becomes stalling. subjective because then it's like, well, what what, what game do you favor? Well, I'm right. more of a guard guy. Well, that guard guy was really getting after it, or man, like that guard passer. I'm a guard passer, and that guard passer, he was stopping exactly. all the guards. I mean, so that's what I'm saying. Let let them decide. Do you give them an advantage? Do you or do you take points away? Do you yeah. you know? I don't know. Like I said, in, in this said, you know, there is no perfect scoring system. There's no perfect tournament side system. Every point system, and they all are point system. It doesn't matter if there's no, like, submission only, right? Because you're doing eventually some sort of, like, fight to win. There is no point system, but they judge yeah. on some criteria. So, therefore, there's some important point system. I was reading an article by Hanger, uh, Josh Hanger, yeah. and he was talking about that. Look, he's like, look, even if you say it's a non-point system, right, well, there's some sort of judging criteria that will decide who wins. Even in EBI, right? You've got like okay, you you held the most, um, like, you had the most hold time, right? You know, or you got the submission they didn't. There was some judging criteria eventually to decide, right? Whether you want to say it's points or if you want to say whatever. I mean, the point thing is actually interesting because like originally in wrestling there was no point system, and in the first Olympics they wrestled and they actually had to stop the match because it was becoming dark, and so they restarted the match the next day and it was oh, finished. Wow. Yeah, and uh, you know they they eventually add the and then they went uh, eventually they had judging paddles where they'd have three judges and they'd hold up paddles at the end to see who won. The judging uh, by points thing came in because of with like uh, um, they didn't want like especially with like the Soviet Union and like the United States and all that stuff going on like where you have these countries that are diametrically opposed from one another, um, you know, in more than more than just one way, right? Like just all this stuff going on, they didn't want them to be biased. Like so, oh. 
They've got all these Soviet judges over here getting the paddles for the Soviet guys, right? And sort of thing. So they were like, look, we're going to come up with this very objective way. This yeah. is how you score points. This is how you win. And so this way they can, you know, have, have a way for people to win rather than, like, having something that's subjective to humans. You know, yeah, to fudge I, up. I think that's where... Yeah, the consi- I mean, yeah, you're right. It depends on what the, the, really the judge favors. I mean, is he giving you advantage for attacking yeah. or from the guard, right. or is he giving you a stalling point for holding? Mm. You know, it just depends on what it is. And I, I don't know. I did like the um, the fight to win format because I think EBI it, it's really strategy. Again, it goes back to strategy. If you don't want to be, if you're not good in that spider web or having yeah. somebody in your back on your back then you're going to try like hell to finish. Mm. But if you're somebody that's more defensive and you can usually play that defense and get to the, um, you know, get to overtime and that's yeah. where you're, you're going to shine. That's right. going to be, you know, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, th- I think it's just, I mean, when it comes down game. to it's sport jujitsu, but when it, when it comes down to, it's always the competitors that decide, you know, it's like, because you, you know, you, you can, it doesn't matter who it is. Like you can have any rule set and you'll have an exciting match. If you have competitors ready to get down at it and get after it. Doesn't yeah, matter. and and I think that you know I've had a problem with like getting like that one guy had me in guard or whatever, and you know what? Don't let him put me in guard. You know that's it. Fight like hell to not get in close guard. That, that you know just work there. Mm-hmm. I mean that's kind of that's what you have to do. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> Chewy, I wanted to talk to you about because you all you've been talking about this diet shit you've been on. Yeah, I know we're we're changing topics, but like. It was funny. I was last week. I was at the gym, yeah. and I was like sitting there, and you were talking about this diet, and then you're talking about somebody else about this diet. So I want to know what the hell this diet is that you're on that you're like bouncing off the walls. Yeah. So it, well, I'm not gonna like go into too, too much detail yet because until I feel like because I'm going through it for is twelve. It, is it milk based? Is there milk in your diet? It's definitely not milk based. Uh, especially if it's not, <laughs> and especially if it's not raw milk. Hey, we'll we'll go. Uh, do you want to get some questions, Maddie? Do we have any questions? Good. Yeah, we got some. I'm sure. Okay, right, cool. Talk talk about your diet first. And then... So we'll do, this, do the diet and we'll do some questions. Yeah, so the we'll diet thing, I'm not going to go into great detail about what it is yet. I'll be sharing some videos through the YouTube channel um, just because for me, like, okay, the reason I say this is because, like, I, I like to be a guinea pig for myself. Yeah. And if it works, then I will talk more about it. Now, I'm going to talk about what I'm doing right now, but I'm not going to go too, too deep into it. But essentially what happened was, is like, this last year, like, you know, I, I jumped I jumped on the bandwagon. I was like, let's go low carb. Let's do this stuff, keto, right? Keto diet. I tried keto for, like, two weeks, and I, I was like, fuck this. Like, it ain't happening. Like, Why I, didn't you like it? it was so, I felt sick. Like, like that's like a detox. That's like it, detox dude, like, you know, I, here's my honest answer. Like, I'm sure, I'm sure it worked great. It works great for some people. Yeah. But for my level of output on a daily basis, man, like, I don't know how to, I don't know how it's going to work. Like, I'm not like, I'm not very sedentary. I'm working constantly. I'm training. Even my job of teaching people is, is, is work, right? Like me, like doing, like teaching people, moving around with kids all day and like working with you guys and like being upbeat and freaking peppy. Like I can't, I wasn't doing that. Like I felt really sluggish. Yeah. Um, and so like for me personally, like, um, you know, I was like, well, like I just wasn't feeling energetic. I was getting run down and my strength was down. My training volume was down. I was like, oh shit, this sucks. So the diet that I'm on right now is actually to lose a little bit of weight to be less fat. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit less fat. And what a lot it, more sexy. Though. And basically, it's car, uh, I'm basically planning my carbs at strategic areas, um, and the carbs are a lot, right? It's a lot of carbs, um, which I'm I'm loving by the way, because I haven't I haven't really like because it's like this last like year I've been like lowering my carbs down, like I was down to like under a hundred and fifty to under a hundred sometimes, and like I tried the keto thing where we're like way low, yeah, where yeah, you're just yeah. doing trace amounts, but that that was awful, but. Like I did, like oh, like where some of these diets will recommend, like oh, go under 150. Try that and it felt terrible, you know. But like now, like like yesterday, for instance, we had a hell of a training session yesterday for the rolling. Um, I had about 125 carbs for the morning, with about 42 grams of protein, um, around eight grams of added. So what are you eating? What kind of sugar are you eating? Um, depends. Like uh, yesterday, like um, I had. Uh, I had some Ezekiel bread and some different fruits, and that's a lot of fruit, by the it's way. It's like complex carbs. I feel like yeah. Um, your thing, Dad. Oh. But, the live video ended. All right, but, um, and then, like, right. trained, and then once I got done training, I had about 175 carbs with my, like, and again, I'm getting protein and fat at every meal, and then, like, 125 carbs, and it was a hard training day session. Now, this morning, I woke up, and I had 60 carbs, right? But, like... So basically, it's, it's a little bit of carbs to load up before the workout, a bunch of carbs afterwards, yeah. and then taper down from there. 
Um, and then typically during my workouts right now, I'm doing some sort of simple sugars uh, with protein. Um, and it seems to be working great. Man. What are you, is you following any kind of program that you, that it you, is a program. So, so it, you, like, so that's where like, you know, cause it's, that's it's you're gonna get into, yeah. Cause I purchased the program. Oh, gotcha. Uh, and so like, gotcha. if it's like one of those things where like it works, I'll share it with everybody. Awesome. Like, and that's why I don't want to put it out there yet. Cause I don't want to be like, Hey, yeah, you guys should go buy this. And then like six weeks later from now, I'm like, Hey, don't, I don't like this anymore. Sucks. Yeah. So I'm going to go for it through two, for, uh, for 12 weeks and I'm going to see how it works. But so far I started off the diet. I was two sixteen. Um, my training volume has gone up. My strength has gone up. My act, I mean, I'm, I mean, man, I've been so friggin' hyper. Yeah. It, all my energy levels up. Everything. Still drinking coffee? Um, yeah, I drink, I drink, I, I no more than usual. And you said no alcohol, right? Yeah, no alcohol. Um, I mean, not that I ever drink a lot anyway, but like no, but no, no, not even like a beer on the weekends. Two eat one beer and he's done. Yeah. Especially right after training. Sloppy that after training beer is good. Okay. Oh, um, yeah. but, uh, and then I'm going to run for 12 weeks, and I've lost about four pounds so far. Nice. Um, but like I said, all my other like measures of like how am I, how am I feeling are up as I'm losing weight. Are you weight. still lifting? Or like yeah. what are you doing? How many days are you training like right now? Are you training hard? Couple, how many days a week are you training like pretty hard rolling? Rolling like maybe two to three. Two to three. And two then, to three. But you're on the mats like pretty much every day or six yeah, days a week. Yeah, right? and I, like I'm still light days sometimes. Like where some days I'll come in and I'll just flow through stuff or I'll do some drill work, you know, like sometimes at different times. Um, but like two, three days of actual training. Like Saturday is always a hard day. Yeah. Um, you know, and then I'll pick a couple other you days. Change out your of diet day. up on those days, like what, like so, heavier. Yeah. So basically, like for instance, like um, if it's a non-training day, my carbs come way down. Gotcha. Right? Like because there's no because it basically like my carbs my carbs dip under 150 for the whole day. Gotcha. But then like when I'm training, they go way up. Right? And then depending, and you have to sort of like pick it out like what day is going to be a hard day, what day is going to be a light day, and you got to kind of know this going into it because depending on what you plan to do that day is what you're going to eat. Yeah. And so they, you have to be, it's very like, it's a performance-based diet is what it is. And so that's why it's like, it's not like a, a lifestyle diet where you're just like, hey, just eat these foods or whatever. It's basically right. like, I'm training and eating with a purpose. Based like, on what you need to do. Exactly. Like, I know I'm going to be, like like yesterday, I knew I was going to get down. I knew I was going to get some hard rolling in for two hours. I was like, I got to I gotta friggin' load up. Gotcha. You know what I mean? And then like today, I knew it was going to be kind of a, today was kind of like a moderate day. Yeah. You know, it wasn't too hard. Like for, like we rolled, like again, like I had about like, we had about three, three to four good, rounds, yeah. three to four rounds in each uh, session, uh, the, the seven and the uh, 11 a.m., you know? So again, you know, but, but I feel really good. It, it, I, you know, and again, it's, it's not the popular like low carb stuff. Sure. But I think that for most people, like they would probably feel better effects on this, like this kind of diet where you're like, you're eating the right foods for what you're doing. Because yeah. you're, again, you know, we're, and I've said this for years, when you're doing jujitsu, you're a high performance vehicle, right? Your body's a machine. And when you start doing stuff like jujitsu, you got to treat it like a vehicle, like a high performance vehicle. You know, first off, you can't feed it junk fuel, right? You got to give it good stuff and you got to give it what it needs to perform, man. Like if you had a high performance car, Right, you're not going to give it shitty fuel and like not take care of the stuff. Like yeah. you're going to have to, you're going to have to take care of it differently. It's not, it's not just sitting around in the garage. Yeah, I think you know? you've done. You know, like what I noticed with you, like you, you definitely have light days mixed in when you used to never have light days mixed yeah, in. Yeah, used to be hard all the time. And then like the other day you were rolling and, and you know uh, we kind of got talking after and you like kind of tweaked your knee a little bit and yeah. I was like I think before you probably would have just tough through it, gone. Yeah. You know, and you probably would have been nothing. But yeah. like it's kind of like you almost address it at the moment and you're like look i gotta I gotta yeah. chill and i think that's really been you know from my perspective i think that as a pt kind of watching watching your awareness of like kind of what like how you kind of know your body now so much better and you know kind of when to push when not to push and i think you're you know you could still go freaking hard well, if you need to but no i think it's that's probably what's kept because you've been really i mean honestly like you know, knock on wood, but you've been injury free. You've been really healthy overall for yeah. for a bit. Well, I think I think the thing is, man, is like I said, you know, I've had like you know within you know the what, 14, 14 years now, fourteen years, I've only had like a handful of injuries yeah. that, that kept me off. A couple knees, Co- like a couple meniscus tears, and then nose. like uh, nose, yeah, and that's it. Like that's it. Like other oh, some tweaks and stuff, you know, yeah. and like that were here and there, but nothing serious. But like I think like right now, it's one of those things where like I'm at the point where I understand like, Flowing. look, man. You know, I'm not doing I'm not doing myself any service if I get hurt a little bit, sure. and then you know where I could just say hey, I'm going to rest. I'm going to let this thing heal up. I'm going to dial back. Like so, what happened was uh, for you guys that are listening and watching, Chad and I were rolling, and what happened was is Chad was like in the middle of just getting done rolling with a hard roll, and then he's coming to me, and I purposely wanted Chad to put me into a lapel guard, right? Because he's been playing with it, and I wanted sperm to, guard, a sperm guard, um, and I wanted him to put me in that position so I could work from it. 
Uh, because again, he's working there, he's good at it, and it's a position that I don't feel very comfortable right. in, so I want to work from there. So I was kind of letting, I was loosening up, which I shouldn't have done because he was going hard, and I, went, I knew he was feeding that collar, and he kind of like jerked his knees, like kind of like one was going this way, one was going yeah. this way, and it just tweaked my knee a little right. bit. And so I was like, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. And you know, he felt bad because he thought he hurt me. I wasn't hurt, but I felt something. And I was yeah. like, you know what, man, I'm, I'm done for the night. Like, because I was like, I, I'd like to come back tomorrow. Like, I'd like to be able to train again, you know? And so I waited. I just rested it up. I went home. Nothing was too – it felt funny that day. But then right. the next morning I woke up and did squats yeah. and did some uh, some leg workouts. Felt great. Came in and had a hard, hard session on Wednesday. That it was like completely wasn't even ready for it. It was like supposed to be like a light day. Yeah. And then a bunch of dudes, started, like a bunch of guys that were visiting, started showing nice. up. And I was like, screw it, we're rolling. You know, we're getting down. We a shit ton of new, like more visitors now. Yeah. Like a lot of people. Yeah. What's that all about? I don't know. They watch this asshole on the internet. <laughs> They're like, I guess what's, I'm going like, to go see him. Like, what's it like, you know, like, I mean, we have a pretty laid back gym, but like, what, what do you feel? What do you feel about that? What do you feel about what? Like, how do you feel like just guys just want to train with you? I don't know. I mean, you're just, you, you came you're just wanted, fucking you, chewy, dude. You, you came in and wanted to train? Me? I, I, you came into the gym, Jimmy, you wanted to train? Who? Actually, me? you know, one of the first times he met me was at an MMA fight. I did. Well, I didn't even meet you. I didn't really talk to you. But you were walking around Adam there. were there, and Adam yeah. was like, dude, that's chewy. And I was like, yeah, he fucking murdered a guy. Yeah. <laughs> just So, so we, 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 we were, terrifying. I was fighting at this outdoor casino, like, fighting area. Like, so this outdoor <laughs> casino had, like, this uh, event area. And so we were, uh, I was fighting there. And I used to train. So... The gym that he originally started at with a friend of mine, I originally owned. It's a long story, but there was like a switching of hands and stuff like that. And so um, when he first met me, it was right after that fight. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, it's like a nap time. I know. Let's get um, some questions. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's Chewy so, so, was pretty, pretty deadly. Yeah. And honestly, like, you know, one of the stories that I always talk about was for me, like when you were training for your last fight and you actually tweaked your knee and I uh, did the whole – you know, the whole thing. And that that's kind of, you know, I was like, shit. Why do people keep asking me stuff? But, you know, maybe I know a thing or two. You know, know a thing or two, maybe. Maybe, but also, like, I think it, it's very rewarding, like, to be able to... Because I know what training... Training is super important mentally, physically, emotionally. Keeps us freaking, you know, keeps me functioning. My wife's like, you know, she, obviously she hates when I'm gone training, but, you know, she she's like, if you don't freaking train, I'm going to lose my mind. So... Um, well, let's get some questions. Chewie's about to fall asleep over here. I'm not gonna fall asleep. I'm just it's it's late, man. Any, oh, stop it! What I've been up, I've been up since six thirty, man. I got up I, at like five thirty, dude. Well, I don't get up five thirty all the time, but I get up well, sometimes. Babies, let me see what we got. We're working with here. That's that's your fault. It's a, uh, whole lot. It's a lot. My brother's on here. What's up, Alex? What does it say? It's a lot of just like people commenting. Okay. What are they saying? Uh, a bunch of different stuff. Okay. Should we look? That's hilarious. Chris Dukes is on here. Yeah, Dukes is still sour What's about up, Dukes. He's still sour about not being on the picture. Yeah, and and not FaceTiming me. Thanks, dude. I want to Epsom Salt FaceTime. Will so, this be on huh? This will be on iTunes. Yeah, this will be on iTunes. Yeah, uh, be on iTunes. You can actually hear the therapist.com uh, is on there, and then also the Juice Therapist podcast. And uh, le- leave a review. It's not Jujutsu the Rapist, Jiu-Jitsu but... Jujutsu the Rapist. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, yeah, it will be on iTunes, also uh, on Stitcher. I usually put it up a couple days after, uh, once I edited a little bit. Who's that? Okay, we got questions? That... Oh, you guys got questions. Okay, cool. Let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, they're rolling in. So, <laughs> what type of kettlebell workouts do you all do, if any? Um, man, as far as kettlebells, I use kettlebells as accessories. Like, I don't really do, yes. I don't do, like, I don't do, like, the bulk of my training with, like, kettlebells. Like, um, I've found, like, for me personally, um, kettlebells are fun to work with, like, doing some, uh, different shoulder stuff. Like, obviously pressing, I could do them for squats and things like that. Like, again, but I do them as an accessory. They're not, the, yeah. like, the, the big heavy mover of my workout. Um, you can do some good hip extension stuff, um, but... Again, typically those are towards like the end of the workout. For me personally, I like um, one of the videos that I actually didn't, and that's probably one of my favorite exercises is, is like doing bottoms up kettlebells, which is a really good wrist, elbow, shoulder stability. Um, that's where you hold that kettlebell kind of upside down. You can do military press or shoulder press. Um, you can even you know do hip swings, and I think that's probably one of the. Um, it's just a different way. It works your body a little differently, and um, I think it's a good way to kind of do a little bit of. Uh, help build some explosiveness through your hips like Chewie was talking about. 
And guys, by the way, anything with like workout stuff related, this guy's like again, he's a he's a really good physical therapist, and he's kept me uh, kept me healthy and moving on the mats for you know, gosh, when did you come over two thousand nine or two thousand ten? Uh, I don't know. Like 2010, right? It's been like seven yeah, years. Yeah, it's been, yeah. It's like seven, that, seven, so year, been, seven years, man. Yeah, man, we've been out here, me and Adam and, and Rich yeah. and a couple of guys, man. It's been it's been really it's been really fun. It's kind of what's motivated me to, I don't know. Yeah, uh, Cassie Campbell, my son is 10, loves you, and just did his second pro fight, which he lost, unfortunately, by armbar. What advice can you give him for overcoming match losses? I mean, you know, to me, that's again it's all perception so like you know it's pro first off second profile it's awesome right the fact that he's gotten that far but like so you got to think about again it's a perception thing he feels bad about the loss but he might look back at this like 10 years later when he's fighting in some big fight and like almost gets caught in a, in the same arm bar but gets out of it because he learned how to defend against it in this particular situation so it kind of goes back to the same thing that we were talking about with eugene with that that green belt or whatever like what do you do you do the same thing anytime you lose you figure out what you did wrong and you keep moving forward because i mean again you gotta we all know that losses are going to happen but then once they actually happen we don't it sucks it doesn't feel good but again that they make us better they're the thing that actually it's, it's what separates the people right again you're going to lose it's what's going to happen but what do you take from those losses and what do you learn from them that's going to like make you succeed later on i mean the 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 seeds of your success for the future are, are they're laying there in the the wake of the loss you just got to choose to pick them up and and you know plant them and nurture them so i would just tell him to watch his video figure out what he did wrong consult his coaches and then get back after training with uh, with more you know you know, energy. I know that for just one slug like, last thing is like I like one of the most worst matches I ever lost as a purple belt. I was so frustrated with myself the way that I lost it. I took a picture of the video, put it on the screensaver on my phone, and every time I would pop up my phone, I would see that picture and it would tell me to go train. And because I kept seeing that thing all the time, it was like I, I got to get to the gym. I got to train harder. I got to push myself, and I got to you know again overcome that loss for for myself. So I think I you got to like Chewy said, but also get back in the gym. Like I had a really bad loss quick loss um and i went and competed the following weekend and i couldn't get out of my head so i had that that's what helped me just get after it because i mean what's the worst thing that's going to happen you know you get caught again but it's already happened before so it's really not that big a deal go okay. maddie um, han what up han 91 han 91s what advice would you give me for going back into bjj Okay. So first of all, why'd you quit in the first place? Yeah, um, don't quit. Guys that are planning on quitting, I'm telling you right now, don't quit. I've met so many people that have quit and they regret it because they're like, man, I really wish I would have stuck with it. So don't quit. Um, so Han, first thing is when you start training again, don't quit um, and just push through it. And as far as being fit, man, like that's what coaches do, right? Like when you come into the gym week, I, I guarantee that while I'm not at that particular gym, I'm sure it's the same way as it is at almost any gym. When you go and boop, boop. Um, I don't know if you can hear the train or not, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. But again, I haven't tried, you know, I'm not at that gym, but I imagine it's the same way it is at every gym that I've ever been to, which is when coaches have new people in, they're like, awesome, perfect. Let's build this guy up, right? Let's build this person up, but let's make them better. And so I think that you, the fact that what's happening right now is you're just fearful because you're fearful of doing something that's going to put you into an uncomfortable situation, right? Because you're like, I quit and now I've got to do it again. And, and I don't know these people and it might be whatever. And you're looking for an excuse not to do it. Okay. Just do it. You already did it once. You, you enjoyed it. So you want to do it again. So just do it. And that's what the coaches are there for. I think from, from my end, um, as far as like things that you can do on your own, make sure your mobility, flexibility, you know, you start doing just some movement drills and things like that that get your body kind of acclimated, you know, to taking some little bumps and bruises. Um, but just make sure you don't go, I think, from doing nothing to jiu-jitsu. I've had some people that I've worked with actually on a one-on-one -on -one basis and they kind of wanted to get into jiu-jitsu. They were kind of nervous about being injured. And... Injuries are always a possibility, but if you can kind of start improving your, your range of motion, your flexibility, do some, you know, some strengthening, I think that's going to help you in the long run for sure to kind of prevent injuries. And, um, and don't just get fixated. I see a lot of people get really fixated on jiu-jitsu, and I think that jiu-jitsu is very addicting. 
But on the other hand, you have to make sure that you do the supplementary work, like you do the the things, you know, like the stretching before, stretching after, the warm up, cool down. Those things are super important to do um, to help prevent injury and keep your body not getting so stiff. But get started. That's right. Go do jujitsu. Go train. Let's do that one. Let's do it. Dumb. Um, what's up, Connor? Uh, Connor Clifford. Connor. Connor. Um, as far as belt testing fees, I'll say it this way: I don't like them. I think they're stupid. I think that there's a better way to do it. Like, in, unless you're charging just the bare minimum fee to cover like the belt and maybe the certificate that you're going to give them. Um, but as far as like actual fee because i've seen like where they do like like 75 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever i think it's dumb actually actually saw one gym that did a a like so they had a blue belt test their blue belt test is like 75 dollars and then they have a pre blue belt test prep like you know what i mean like you're prepping for the act or something a blue belt prep test like you know workshop that was 40 bucks you know, like it's stupid. It's like it, it is what it is. It's the money grab. Um, I think there's a better way to bring value into the gym, and, and then you know, get in exchange for extra money if you need it. Um, the only thing that I could say is, I guess maybe the only way that it could be okay, I guess, is if you're if you were at a really really small gym and your instructor's having a lot of trouble paying the bills. I guess maybe that could be a reason that they would charge that. But honestly, again, I think they're stupid. I don't like them. I think it's just a way to like squeeze more money out of people. Um, and then as far as minimum time requirements. I'm okay with minimum time requirements. I don't think that you should just hop from one belt to the next. I think that there's a lot of, again, because I think if you're hopping too quickly, then you're going to keep chasing that belt. I think that there's a lot of cool things that happen when you're basically stuck where you're at and you don't have any external motivation other than, you know, like, you know, maybe a submission or whatever. And so then you are winning at something, right? So then you have to go internally and figure out what's going to keep driving you. Because if you're constantly chasing externals, right, like like belts and and things like that, then I I don't think that jujitsu is going to stick with you long term because of the nature of it. So I think it's important to have people basically in that sort of uh, jiu-jitsu purgatory where you're basically like I'm a really good blue belt but maybe I'm not ready but but our time requirement says that I'm not ready for purple belt or something like that so now I'm just training just because I want to train and I'm not worried about a belt or anything like that so I think t- time requirements are good um, and uh, yeah <laughs> what do I have to say about it? I guess what nothing do I don't like do you, can I start can I start charging you 100 bucks for a belt promotion? me? yeah would you pay that? Um, yeah I mean I would it, because I I mean I don't think you would do that, but I think if you did that, it would be out of probably um, I don't want to say necessity, but just because it's maybe something that you put a lot of effort in and it was worth your time. I mean I I'd like your the thing is that if you ask people to do that, they probably would because we trust you. Well, right. Well, and that's that, the thing. that's the thing. It's yeah. the difference. You're, we know you're not trying to fucking squeeze money out of us. So like if you did charge that hundred bucks, I mean yeah, it's pretty steep. But you know what? I mean, that's just the way it is. And see, I'll, I'll agree with that. Like, if they were, like, again, I'll charge for things if they, if I put a lot of myself into something. Because, you know, everybody should be compensated for their time and their efforts. Sure. Um, and, again, like, but that that's something I think is super important. Like, again, as an instructor, there has to be this balance between, you know, like, maintaining the, the trust and the friendship and the, and the the community and running the business. Because you don't want to cross that. Because then, again, like you said, you just you destroy the trust that you have with your, your people in the gym. Yeah, for sure. The big things that me personally, right? The first off, you have to figure out why you're going to train, like why you want to do it, um, and find the gym that's obviously going to cater towards that style. Um, but the biggest thing is, man, because to me, to me, and this is my opinion, this is not fact, this is not the reason that everyone trains because some people just don't. But for me, the thing that keeps me coming is like the the gym feel, the community of it, right? Like, what is it? Sure. What are the people like? Because the people are the ones that are going to bring me back from years to come, right? Like that's when I look at it over and over again. To me, like the relationships that I've built with people, those are the things that really stick with me uh, more so than just every just the training itself. Um, you know, the 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 experiences that I have with my buddies when we're going out to matches. We're competing with each other and stuff like that and just everything in between. And so I would go to the gym and find the one that makes you feel comfortable, the place where you feel like, man, yeah, this is good. Obviously, do your due diligence and your research. Make sure it's not a shit gym. Make sure that you have a legit instructor, things like that. But, like, you know, I've seen people where they've gone to 
like particular gyms because of a particular like prestige of the name, right? Oh, this guy, this gym has this name or this instructor, but they didn't really like it. And they eventually moved to a gym that didn't have the same sort of prestigious name attached to it, but they enjoyed the experience better. And so that made them stick around better and then made them want to train more. And so I think that you got to find the place that makes you feel right. That's like, yeah, I want to be a part of this. And so the only way to do that is to go around to the gyms in your area and train at them and, and see which ones, you know, make you feel right. Like we actually had a buddy of mine who, um, he got cut out of a picture recently, Mr. Dukes. See, Dukes. Dukes. He was mad about that picture. Um, and so Dukes went to, like, he told me that he went to every, like, gym. He, I don't think he trained everyone, but he just kind of walked in and started talking to everyone in every gym. And our gym is literally, like, like an hour or so away from his home, right? So for him to get here, he crossed and had to go pay. had to pass, like, four or five gyms to get to us, yeah. right? And he said they went to the gyms, and this was the one where he said he walked in, and he was like, yeah, it feels good. Like, you get a vibe from people, you know? And he's like, I walked in, I felt welcome, everybody was upbeat. He's like, yeah, I want to be a part of this. And so he's been with us then, gosh, for since 2012, I guess. 2012? I think so, yeah, 2012, 2013, something like that. I get, I get those years mixed up. And uh, so, again, find the place that makes you feel welcome. Go train at the gyms. A lot of times they have free classes. You can go talk to the instructor, see what you think, go from there. Um, for me, I uh, well, the way I started training was – actually saw some guys fight in a cage inferno event and i was like that's pretty awesome they were kicking everybody's ass and i was like i want to go just see actually i had a buddy that said he trained quote-unquote wrestling or did wrestling class at this gym so that's why i showed up he ended up not showing up with me so i had my first class there and david riley gave me my first class my first white belt class it was hilarious um but it was a small gym and we liked it and then when that gym kind of uh closed down uh, my buddy Adam and I were just kind of searching. We kind of spent about two, three weeks between gyms. And honestly, we didn't know if our jujitsu journey was over. Um, but, you know, we had some people that kind of reached out. And Derek, who's one of the owners of, of Derby City, was really accommodating and, um, you know, really seemed like he wanted to have us out. And um, obviously, Chu was here. And uh, Chu was just beginning to kind of um, take over as one of the main instructors at the time. And, um it was huge. It was such a big gym. There were so many different classes just coming from a, just basically like a tiny gym with like three heavy bags, you know, basically. About a MMA, thousand square feet. And, I remember. And basically it. an MMA gym uh, to a gym that does MMA and kickboxing and has weights and stuff like that. So um, it was really big at first, but like we just kind of got to know people and everybody was awesome. And I think that that's true. You, you come back for the people. Um, obviously the instruction has got to be top notch and you know over here it's it's the best but no it really is chewy's it, it, you know the thing about chewy is we, we joke around with him about like being this big celebrity but like we do and we we screw them all the time but the thing is chewy is the same dude and he's the same guy that's going to be here at 10 30 at night with one of his uh one of his buddies doing a podcast uh when he's got probably a shit ton of other things to do and that just shows you that you know you're part of a good gym so you know I asked Chewy for whatever, and he's, like, always helping everybody out. So, you know, he likes to ramble, but... And, and the we, rambles we, didn't start on YouTube, either. But, the rambles started here. But we keep him around anyways. No, but it, it's just... It's just a... It's a, it's a <laughs> well, one of the white belt, like, uh, the girls, Caroline, tonight, one of the white belt uh, women, she was she's on the mat, and I, I was rambling on about something, about perception and all this stuff, and she goes... Hey, is class over? And I was like, no, we're going to roll. She's like, okay. And she's like, let's get a move on. I was like, damn, right. dude. Hating. It's all right, dude. No, it's it's good because we delve into some deep shit. <laughs> it's fun. Frankie Sharp has asked a few times, like, how do you deal with someone who smells bad? And Frankie like, Sharp. Do you tell them? Tell them to wash their fucking gi. Dude, just, <laughs> tell, just talk to them. Like, I mean... Like, you know, I've had to do that as the coach because I know it's kind of an uncomfortable – maybe talk to your coach. That would be a good idea. Yeah. Like, because they're like we, – we've had a couple people, like, where, like, the one guy, his geese smelled terrible. Chad. Like, well, no, worse than Chad's. <laughs> um, Caspian's. We called him Caspian. I uh, went up to him and I was like, hey, man. I was like uh, – <laughs> You're up, I man. It's like, you know, I brought him over to the side. I was like, hey, man, everybody's, like, complaining about your ghee, whatever. And, I mean, his ghee, you could smell it about 10 feet away. Like, you could smell it. You're like, oh. <laughs> and I told him, I was like, man, when's the last time you washed that? And he, and he had to think. Like, his head, his, like, he went, uh. I was like, just, just you're, go home and wash it. Let's just go home and wash it. Like, that, that smell, that's, uh, that's bacteria, brother. Um, and then uh, we had one kid who did not wear any, he, like, he didn't have any deodorant. No, he didn't clean under there. Or something like it was. 
and I'm not. I, I wear like hippie deodorant. Like I wear like the the non like aluminum, you know, whatever yeah. stuff. So I, I probably have a bit of a smell to me too. Um, but you know, get in there and clean and, and, and wipe it down. So it's not terrible. I haven't had any terrible complaints yet. And, and the little kids that I teach, they would tell me they'd be like, "Chili, you stink," because I've had it happen before. <laughs> they, they don't hold back punches, man. They're like, "You smell bad." Um, but. So the uh, so I had to talk to the kid. I was like, "Hey man," I was like, "You know, I, I brought him to the side. I had him in. A couple of the people are, and he he beat me too. He's like, I smell, don't I? I was like, "Yeah, you smell me." I was like, "So he, he took care of it." So just talk to your coach. Let him know. I was like, "Man, look, every time I roll with so and so, they smell kind of bad. If you wouldn't mind talking to him again, just so that it's it's not because if it's bothering you, probably bothering other people. Um, if it's their breath, like because maybe they smoke or something, you just got to hold your breath in." Just probably not a good idea for jiu-jitsu because you do need to but work on that anaerobic cardio. Anaerobic. <laughs> All right, Maddie, let's go. Let's go. We got a few um, more left. Lots and lots of questions about motivation and like, have you guys had uh, issues with it over the years? I think. Well, you, here, got, you, go, you had it first time. I'll go after. Um, with I just had a, another kid, and so I have two. I have a twenty-two-month-old and a one-month-old, and Keep I'll tell it in you, your pants. I'm telling you, like. I've never been more motivated to train because to get out of the damn house. No, I'm kidding. No, uh, honestly, like, I think you just, you get to a point where it's just something, it's part of what you do. It's just like you don't feel like you're, like, it's just seeing your friends and seeing your training partners. You get such a high from training, um, and it feels amazing to train. I think just, and you're not always going to feel like you're you're on it, and you always want to, you know, some of the days you're going to be tired, but I think, like, Seeing progression is a great motivator. You know, staying in good shape, getting better is, is you know, a good. What are you doing? I, I put the cap on and started drinking again. Oh, so um, for me, I think motivation is, is a lot of different things. I think just it keeps me, jujitsu keeps me kind of keeps me balanced, and I like seeing, you know, who. Where else do you get to go see like close friends? Like two to three times a week, at least, you know, I think that's a great motivator seeing people that, you know, you are kind of, you know, close to and, and you kind of sweat with and lead with and stuff. I think it's that's a big motivator. Just um, being being a great training partner, too. I mean, man, like as far as motivation goes for training, like like Eugene said, training just has to become something you do. It's not something like, oh, man, I got to get motivated. No, no, it's just you just do it right. You get up, you go train. It's not, it's not if, and, or, but. Like, if you really want to get good at this stuff, if you really want to take it as far as you can go, you get up and you train. That's all it is. And motivation comes and it goes, right? Because there's sometimes where you're fired up, you're ready to go, you're yeah. super excited, and then other times you're not so excited. But the thing that I've always found, and literally, like, there's been times where, like, for instance, this gym was, like, the, was like the, the thing that was keeping me together, like, my sanity, like, when my mother was getting sick and she was getting closer and closer to passing away, right? So I'm, like getting like you know down to the point where i don't i don't really want to get up and do anything right. and then i was like but i'd get in the gym and I'd train and i remember it would be like i would feel so much better when i would train i've never never once have i regret going to the gym and trained now i've regret not going to the right. gym and train but i've sure. never went to the gym and be like man you know what i really wish i wouldn't have come today i'm always pumped up about it and there's a lot of studies now that show like like your mind will follow your body right so again like, if you're feeling kind of in a rut, you're feeling kind of down in the dumps, you don't want to get up, go and train, especially there. Don't wait for it to get better. Go and train now because your body will follow suit. Your body gets in the motion, trains, you'll be happy that you did it. And, again, it just has to become something that you do rather than, like, and, and again, not even something you do, but it becomes a part of you, right? You just do it because yep. it's what you're supposed to do. Um, and, again, don't look to be you – can, you can get motivated to get pumped up. Go watch some highlight videos. Go watch whatever you watch to get motivated. That's cool. But again, understand that motivation kind of fluctuates, and so you got to just—you just have to train through that stuff. I like to listen to Nickelback. It gets oh me my pumped up. What are you laughing about, Maddie? Someone said that. <laughs> what did they say? Because I was right in the middle of like—I was like getting to like my my mom's dad and Maddie's like <sighs> like laughing. Are you back crying? Are you laughing? And I just talked no, about Nickelback. Nickelback. Sorry. Uh, jumpy squirrel. Said jumpy squirrel. Oh wait, no, no, that's wrong. Jumpy squirrel. Yeah, those those nogi things can get stinky. Yeah, they can. Those you got rash guards. Yeah, soak them. 
A little white vinegar. Vinegar. Um, there's a question about. Let me see. Chewie's getting tired. I'm not getting tired. I could do this oh, all night. Come on, let's go. All nighter. I gotta, I'm going to go home and drink my casing shake. Okay. <laughs> He's looking. It was something about um, starting uh, Jiu Jitsu with, I think, a partial ACL tear. Yeah. Okay. Um, That's your your, uh, your domain, my friend. First of all, it depends on if it's, you know, how far out of injury are you, if you've done the proper rehab. Um, a lot of times, you know, with ACL, you know, if it's not a bad enough for surgery, um, the main thing you want to do is strengthen the tissue around it. And that's just not the knee, the muscles around the knee, but also the hip. And um, so there's a lot. I think you have to listen to your body. As far as certain movements go, um, there may be certain positions that you – that don't feel comfortable to your knee, um, I would avoid those things. Um, I just think you have to go based on feel. You have to go really slow and light, let people know of your injury um, so they're aware, um, and let your coaches know. Uh, just just make sure that they understand that there's maybe certain things that you're not used to or your body's not used to doing yet. Um, do them in a slow and controlled environment, and then increasing, you know, Speed and, and, and muscle memory, repetition, I think is huge. So if there is a technique that you're learning, uh, start slow and, and really build muscle memory. I think that's going to really help your body, um, you know, respond properly and let your muscles respond properly. Um, make sure, you know, do the proper accessory work. Do the warm-up cool down. Um, obviously, strength training is important. Um, and, you know, just listen to your body. I think, Chewy, what do you think somebody presents, you know, to, to the gym and says they've got a knee injury or, or, or have a, a knee that's susceptible to injury, what do you do? I mean, in any injury, you train to what you can do. So, I mean, you just got to, like, a lot of things are going to have to be modified. You're going to have to stay away from certain positions, and you've got to make sure you don't let your ego get in front of you. Like, yeah. if you are if you start to get into a position where you're like, man, this feels funky on my leg, right? Or, like, out, yeah. every time I do this position, my knee hurts, just stay away from it. Just, you know, back off. Um, I think the beautiful thing about jiu-jitsu, and Chewy kind of said, it's kind of like a choose-your-own-adventure kind of book. There's so many ways that jiu-jitsu can go. There's there's guys that, you know, without legs or, you know, without arms that can do jiu-jitsu and be very effective. And there's people that are in their 60s, 70s that can do jiu-jitsu and be very effective. So jiu-jitsu is kind of all-encompassing. It's for everybody. It's something that really attracted me to jiu-jitsu as a physical therapist. It's something that I felt like I could do at a high level for a long period of time. And continue to do and be effective at it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think you just, you just have to kind of build your game around your abilities, not really your disabilities, I guess, you know. Because uh, we've got a guy who's a black belt and has very minimal use of his right arm because he had a really bad injury. He was born, uh, I think, Adam. Yeah. Yeah, and so he he's very, very tough. And he can't even he, lift his arm. Yeah, he can't lift his arm past like 90 degrees, you know, past shoulder height. And very effective. He just modified his game to, you know, and that's the thing. Some stuff, when you get older, you're not, your body's not going to be able to be as explosive. You're not going to be able to do certain things. So Well, that's where, you know, go back to it. Go old man jiu-jitsu. Creativity. That's just, right, man. Creativity just, is, is spawned out of necessity. Yeah, and also consistency. You know, I think that's that's huge, being consistent. I think your body, you don't let your body kind of decline. You kind of keep it at that, that nice level of, of um, function. You're consistently an asshole. This is why I come to this gym. Yeah. What you got, Maddie? Any more? Um, here and a lot more. Holy but, balls. Yeah. You guys don't have to answer all of them. We can answer some. I'm fine. We can answer as many as y'all want. We'll just Aaron we need to re restate the question, probably just make sure they can hear. Okay. We'll restate um, it. Um so what do I do if I did something stupid against BJJ etiquette? I accidentally came into a rolling too hard and too overconfident and seemed to alienate myself from favor of the coaches early. Uh we've had some people that have that Oh, that, so no, so so uh, black belt, in, in case belt we're, in, ca- in case we're listening to the um, on the podcast and you can't hear, um, the guy was basically he did something bad, he broke etiquette, and he um, sort of pissed off some of the coaches, <laughs> and so he's kind of wondering what he can do. Um, treat it as a loss, treat it as a, a negative thing that you have to learn from. So you obviously did something <laughs> wrong, fix it, right? So we had what were you doing? Ken Cole asked about. Uh, 
Old man jiu-jitsu. Old man jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Um, you know, we had a guy actually in the gym, Frank. Frank's a great <clears throat> example of this. Frank is the man. Frank came in, and he was talking a lot. Like, he was talking all the time about, like... Man, you're not beating me unless you're, he's like a brand new white belt. And, you know, when brand new white belts come in, we kind of like take it easy on him a little bit. Now, he had potential, and he kept saying these things, these sort of trash talk, and it really upset a lot of people in the gym. And so um, he upset some of the higher belts, and they rolled with him a different way. And afterwards, he was like, are you guys pissed at me? I was like, well, no, we're not pissed at you. But, I mean, kind of, like, but we're upset with you doing this stuff. And we, we don't want you to talk because then that can become a gym cancer, right? Because if you become a guy who, like, talks shit in the locker room, like, if you, like, step on the mat with an ego, like, you, you're, you're going to try to rough people up, then people are going to go after you because you're being an asshole, right? Because, again, the, the gym's not about, like, smashing your training partners, right? If you want to go to competitions and smash them, it's fine. That's, that's competition. But when you're training, the so job is crotch. I'm building you up, and then you're going to help build me up. And we go back and forth. And so I really want to make sure I'm taking care of my training partners. And I want to, like, if I submit them, don't talk about it. Help them up, right? Don't act like a, an egotistical asshole. Get up and train with them. Help them back up every time. We talked to Frank about that. And Frank's done a complete 180. And he's in our good graces again, man. He's like, all, awesome, every, everybody loves him, dude. He's so cool. Like, again, so just take it like Frank did. Learn from it. You made a mistake. We all do. Fix it. Don't do it again. Dude, like, like, stop it. Like, again, if, if you're getting like that over, overzealous with your submission, if you're rolling with an attitude, then you have a problem, man. You got to address it. And it's probably coming from an insecure place. So just stop it. And, again, understand we're here to, like, build each other up. I think from a teammate perspective and a, and a partner perspective, um, people are just not going to want to roll with you. So I think – realizing that you've made a mistake and, you know, acknowledging that, I think that's the first thing. And then just kind of, you know, rolling people and being cool and just trying to try to be different or apologize if you do something, you know, if you, here's a great question, dick move. Would you, would you want to roll with yourself? Cause if you don't want to roll with yourself, probably no one else is going to want to roll with you. Right. So just keep that in mind. What's up? Kevin, Kevin Dishon. Kevin Dishon. D- so Kevin sorry Dishon. Sorry, Kevin. Have you already answered any questions on weightlifting and BJJ? I train three to four times a week. Uh, still want to lift to just be a strong dude. How do you maintain your manly muscles in BJJ? Manly muscles. So uh, weightlifting and BJJ. Uh, I actually have some videos on the way. I actually filmed a ton of videos. I just never got them cut up uh, on some of my workouts. I need to get that done for sure. you guys. To cut it. You can, I hate that song. Uh, <laughs> um. <laughs> That's the song of a 2016 uh, oh, Master World. Uh, it wouldn't go away. Cut it. It's such a bad song. Um, lyrics really deep. Yeah. So good. as far as weightlifting for BGJ, I am. I'm. I'll, I'll talk about some of the stuff that I do. Um, but I'm not gonna. Again, I'm not gonna say that this is the way because man, like everybody's got their like. Their little angle to this, oh, this is the way you're supposed to do it. Oh, this is the way. Oh, this way. First off, you have to identify, like, why are you lifting, okay? Understand that if you're doing jiu-jitsu, if that is your focus, well, that's your focus then, right? Lifting comes second. Understand that because I've gone into these situations where I was trying to be this, like, I was doing, like, I was back uh, 2008. I was up to 255 pounds. I was powerlifting and wanting to do strongman competitions. And I was going, can, burning the candle at both ends. And I was focused too much on lifting and too much jiu-jitsu. And eventually, I backed off the lifting with the jiu-jitsu. So make sure you're, if you're focused on jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu's first. Now, as far as being strong, you can still maintain your strength. You're just going to, one, I don't know what kind of lifting you do. Um, uh, to me, if you're worried about being just, if you're kind of like a meathead like I am, you want to focus on your big compound movements, okay? I mean, again, if you're in the gym, you're not going to have a ton of time because obviously you're doing jiu-jitsu and you don't want to spend a ton of time doing a bunch of like friggin' arm accessory work. Yeah. Go in there and do some big compound movements, get the, t- the body taxed and, and get some work done in a relatively short amount of time. Um, pay close attention to um, your shoulders uh, and your pecs. Okay, the reason I say this is I'll tell you the problems that I ran into a lot of times. Like too much like this here in jiu-jitsu, anything creates this tight pec. So you need to do things to strengthen upper back, loosen up these pec muscles so your shoulders are in better alignment both when you're lifting and when you're doing jiu-jitsu. Also, your your hips. Hips, hips, hips. Like my hips, like I do a variation of a sumo deadlift. Um, a lot of times, whether I'm doing it for heavyweight or not, uh, or like some maximal loads, 
just to strengthen my hips. And I find, this is no joke, like literally I'll come in on a day where my knees feel stiff and I'm like, oh man, I hurt. I'll do some sumo deadlifts and I feel amazing afterwards. Like my, my knees don't hurt, my hips feel better. Because the one thing that jiu-jitsu does is we get these really tight hips from like flexing in and everything's tight here, but we don't do a whole lot of hip extension exercises. So one of the things that I would do is, is along with your strength training to be the meathead, to be strong, you want to make sure that you're adding in ex- exercises that are going to help offset jiu-jitsu um, in the way that it messes us up. So adding in hip, hip extension exercises, adding things to open us up and really sh- like basically push a chest out. Super important stuff because otherwise if you don't, if you're like w- you're walking around jiu-jitsu afterwards and you're not, you're doing squats and things like that, but you're not really doing anything to fully extend those hips out, you're going to find that you're going to run to a lot of knee issues, hip issues, shoulder issues. Uh, back issues so it, for another thing man is like look everybody complains about their lower back in jiu-jitsu i used to have lower back issues as well and, I, and as i started to strengthen my hips and work on hip extension more and more i didn't have the same issues that i had now now i feel like my my, my lower back's fine like you know but again it used to really bother me so again that said i i usually work around a press like a, a workout that's basically a press focused a pull focused and then some sort of like a leg day. And then, like, I mean, that's kind of what I do. I do it three days a week. Um, so typically you'll have like a day where I do like, um, you know, maybe a bench press or a overhead press of some sort. Uh, next day might be like, you know, a bunch of uh, like a deadlift and a bunch of pulls possibly maybe with some upper body stuff worked in there. And then I'll do a leg day, which might be another variation of a deadlift might be some squat type stuff, whatever. But again, you know, but you can go wherever you want to just make sure that when you're doing weight training, you're making sure that it's again, coming back to it, that it's supporting you inside the gym uh, or on the mats rather than taking away from it because you're too sore, you're too beat up uh, or anything like that. I, I went on the tangent. I think I, Chewy said like a lot of stuff he says really hit the nail on the head. So doing things that kind of counteract jujitsu, so rounded, flex posture, we're going to do things to kind of open up the chest, work those glutes and hamstrings, some of those things that are um, and those like abductor muscles that are really kind of weak and and not used as much because we always squeeze and are compressed down um and the other thing kind of train for what you want to accomplish like if you want to be more explosive train more explosive movements like sumo deadlifts can be more explosive kettlebells um just train for kind of what you need if you're getting closer to a tournament i think you do more explosive and you do more you know, specific jujitsu type movements, things that mimic jujitsu. But if you're just trying to get stronger, I mean, yeah, those simple, you know, it just really depends on your goals. Um, just depends on what, what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, if you're trying to just do muscle mass, I mean, I guess. Now, so let me, let me see what you think about this. So like for me personally, I've always like, I've come to the agreement on like to me in my head, like, like as far as working out, basically just basic human movement, movement patterns, you know, push, pull, um, squat, lunge, you know, th- different things, right? Yeah. Like basically just basic movement patterns. Because I feel like for me personally, and I don't know what you think about this, if I try to mimic jiu-jitsu through lifting, I feel like I tax the muscles that I'm already using too much, right? Like where it's like, man, I'm just doing the same shit over again. And then it's like, you know what I mean? Like then it's like I feel like I'm overdoing it. Like there was a workout one time that um, I got out of like a one of these magazines and I was like, yeah, I'm going to go and try this workout. And it was like, you know, do this for four weeks or something. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll give it a try for four weeks. Sure. And I remember I was running into it like, like, like really like my – it wasn't like injuries as in like I can't train. It was more of like – like overworked body right. parts, right? Like because I was like doing too much of one thing and too much of another. Like one of them was like had me on the ground doing curls like this. Like it was like the bicep defense move. I was like, this is not a bicep defense, but I was like, or uh, the armbar defense. But yeah, I was like, whatever. Yeah. I was like, I'll do it. And I remember like doing all these different movements, man. And my body was really beat up from it. Like I didn't feel good. Like when I lift now, I feel good. Yeah, I think um, I agree with that. But also, you have to balance. Like, say um, if you're training for, you know for endurance you're tra- or you're training for a competition you do want to work because that's kind of you're getting more into muscle memory and more specific type movements more explosion so you can't just do drilling so i think there's certain ways to get stronger get better at those movements get more explosive so i think yes uh, i think there's uh, definitely a balance between doing too much and not enough um and I think you would do that more as a tapering down when you're getting closer to competition. So it's not something I would do okay. long term. So I would do like like the type of lifts you do. But then if I'm trying to get ready to build my speed, build my explosiveness, I'm going to start adding those similar type of movements that kind of mimic the jujitsu specific things I want to accomplish. Okay.
Stefan. What's the best way to try out new positions? Well, well first I've off, tried a few. You talk to your significant and, uh, other and you say, hey, I was really thinking about this thing. Um, um, but be careful. You may get babies from it. So I'm yeah. just saying. Two of them. Two babies. And then, you can't, babies. and then you can't train as much. Yes, you can. Um, Anything's possible. In the bedroom. In the bedroom. That's yeah. right. Um, <laughs> just, man, just... just there is no good time. Just do it. Like, just pick a position you want to do and just go with it, man. And, like, again, like, as far as how often you should, like, honestly, if things are going well and you feel like you're making progress, great. It, 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 treat it like a lifting routine, right? When you're, when, you, when you're in the gym and you're, like, hitting a sticky point, what do you do? You change up the workouts, yeah. change up the routine. So go in the gym, train. If, if you feel like you're hitting a sticky point in your game, don't feel like you're making any progress, feel like you're hitting a rut, say, all right, I'm going to try out some new stuff. And as far as when to do it, just do it. If you experience trouble, like mentally going okay, like you know, going with it because you don't want to lose or something, pick the people that you can beat and work on the, whatever that new position is. This way, it's almost like active drilling, right? Because then, you know, like for instance, if, if I roll with like a like a blue belt or something, you know, I could roll them over and smash them if I wanted to, right? But what I get way more value out of is like I'm going to pick one of these sweeps I'm working on, trying to add into my game, and I'll drill it on them, or and I'll I'll roll with them, and I'll actually do that move that I'm doing, and then I'll actually release whatever I'm doing afterwards so that they can escape, and then we'll just keep going back and forth, and then I get a lot of active reps with doing this move, and then I'll eventually be able to work that game up into the rolling that I have with uh, similarly skilled opponents. So just do it. Yeah. Also, like uh, like Chewie talked about going down the rabbit hole, like you may go into one position or one movement or whatever, and then you may find something else you like even better or something that's even more effective. So I think just playing around, exploring is a great way to, you know, for sure. Because I, I think I found trying a certain position and building off of that into other, going in a different direction, I think has helped me too. Mm-hmm. What advice do you give to a white belt to be a good partner from Andrew? It's like along the lines of more etiquette. Oh. Man, like, I don't know. Like, I mean, to don't me. Don't be a dick. Don't be a dick. But, I mean, like, as far as, like, think about, like, who, like you know, like, you can always kind of go back to a golden rule of some sort, right? Like, like how do you want to be treated? Right, like, right. like, who would you want to roll with? Who would you want? How would you want your partner to be with you? Right? Like, uh, dude, when you wouldn't, your, would you want your partner to have a nasty, stinky old gi that's got friggin' like green crap fall off the sides? Do you want your partner like, like walking their feet bare feet out in the back in the bathroom, taking a poop? Um, do, do, do you, you know, <laughs> if, <laughs> I've got God. some deep seated resentment. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, would you want your partner to like roll with you like a hundred percent and like argh, every time they're no, of course you wouldn't. So just you know, again, you're you're there with your buddies. Again, you guys are there to get better together. So um, just keep in mind that part of what your goal is in the gym is not to just build up yourself, but to help build up everybody around you, right? To keep your partners healthy, right? So you're not going to wrench submissions. Um, you know, if you're if you're doing a technique with them, you're not going to go. You're not going to fully resist while you're drilling a technique. You know, you're going to be respectful to them at all times. Um, if you submit them, you're not going to get up and celebrate. You're going to extend your hand back up and say, good job, man. Come on back up. Let's do it again. Right? Like, again, just take care of your partners because you're going to – because if you train and you're in a good gym, these guys, you're going to become like brothers with these dudes. You're going to, you're going to know them for the next, like, indefinite amount of time of your life, right? Like, I mean, you'll, you, I mean I, there's guys that have been in this gym I've known for over a decade. So, again, they're like – I'm very close to these people. So, again – you treat them like they're your brothers because they're going to become over time and your sisters, you know, because again, you know, all the, all the men and women that are in there, you're going to get close to them, you know, so just keep that in mind. I think, um, also don't be afraid to ask, like, is this, am I doing stuff? Is this something like, and follow by example, like, or you should have upper belts at the gym that, you know, that should lead by example that are coaches and, and people you look up to and people you can ask, is this okay? Or, should I do this or I did this? Talk to your coach too, and um, I'm sure they'll they'll keep it you know they'll they'll keep it straight with you. They'll let you know, you know, probably don't do that or that's okay or and and a lot of times you know if if you're being an ass and then an upper belt goes and puts it on you, you're probably not you're probably not uh not favored at the gym. So I'd say follow you know ask and and. Use people as examples that are upper belts have been in the gym for a long time and they're in good, you know, they're well, well liked, I guess. We'll do a couple more. A couple more. Two more questions. 
you got? Make them good. Chewy, that's something we can talk about. We don't talk about this time, but traditions at gyms. Because, like, I had, I was turned away to tie my belt, and a white belt asked me, why did I do that? And it was something that, you know, it was a kind of a respect thing is the what I said. And we kind of talked about that. We don't have to get into it. But that's also, I mean, just look at the traditions, I guess, at your gym and, and being respectful, I think. Mm-hmm. What you got, Maddie? Too many good questions. What percentage of my BJJ training should I devote in my takedown judo groups? And that was again from Frankie. Damn, Frankie with all the questions. What percentage? Oh, did he? What percentage of uh, BJJ training should be takedowns and judo throws? I don't know. Um, ten to ten to. Ten. It's so hard to give it a number, man. And it, honestly, it's going to be depending on you. Because you might, like, there's guys that pull guard, and that's their game. Um, as far as takedowns go, we do, like, for Me. instance, every week we do takedowns on Mondays. It's what we do every Monday. So every Monday we do takedowns. Every single Monday. Um, sometimes we'll do whole weeks of takedowns, but in most cases, every. Oh, my God. Yeah. Ah! So sleepy. Um <laughs> But every Monday, so you know, I guess it makes up like a little less than twenty percent of the time training throughout the week. So, um, you know, takedowns are super important. I think for self defense purposes, it's takedowns are important. Like you can go on YouTube and you can watch videos of people get get into a fight on the street, and whoever gets slammed on the concrete first, that's it done. Like you pick a guy up and slam him on the concrete, there's no getting back up. Um, that's why in judo, for instance, like right, they stand straight up, and when they, if they slam, that's it. And part of the reason why the slam is it is because if you get slammed on concrete yeah, outside, no. you're not getting up, dude. Like that's done. And same thing in, in you know in wrestling, man. Like you pick a guy up and double leg him and dump him on his neck, man, he's done. So very important to takedowns. And then for jujitsu, to me, like if you can do takedowns or you can pull guard, you can basically fight either top or bottom, and you can control those positions. To me, that's an advantage. So I don't know what the percentage is, but just do them. You know? I think it's what you're working on. If you're working on takedowns, I think that's one of the weaker parts of my game. So there's, I found a couple of things I really wanted to work on, and <clears throat> I would drill those takedowns a lot. And, and so I think that's the way to get better is drill. If that's something you want to, you know, if you've already developed that in your game, then I, like Chewy said, you know, 10%, 20%, whatever. But if that's something you want to incorporate or get better at, I think you have to do more repetition, more more. um more drilling of that. So that's what helped me. I love that you're just holding a selfie stick. It's awesome. I am. Well, I have to keep going. I was trying to read with the stuff. You don't have to, you don't have to like doll it up, man. You got that selfie stick. All right. Last question, Maddie. Last one, make it good. We'll see. We got five minutes, man. We're gonna All right. Five minutes. We're going to fucking end this. It's, it's 1055. We're 10 not going to end it. So we'll, we'll go until like 11. All right. Uh, question for both of you. Oh, shit. What? Submission chains. Well, it depends on where you start from. Kimuras. I have a whole series from Kimuras. And then rear naked chokes. I love getting the back and doing uh, some sort of choke. and be rear naked choke. and be like uh, different lapel chokes. Um, but I have a ton of series that I do from that. Um, and I, I love them just because I think one Kimuras, this has always been one of my favorite moves. And I think I, they're so versatile. You can catch them all over the place. And then the rear naked choke. Man, it just... It, to me, it's like there's... It's one of the best submissions. I've taken your back and I've put you Monteleone. in a choke. Doesn't matter how big or strong you are, I can choke you and wrap my arm around your neck, and that's that. You know, I, so I just that's for me. That's my, those are my. For favorites. me, it is definitely um, it all starts if I'm on bottom cross collar grip. So I go cross collar grip and I go to you know anything. I mean, you can take the back from it. You can you know go for an arm bar loop choke. I, I like really going. A lot of times I use the loop choke to set up. Uh, sweeps and passes and, and, and stuff like that. So I, I just like the cross-collar grip as just a really good starting point because, you know, you're so close to submission. You're already halfway there pretty much. So I think that is probably um, – I use that to build off a lot of if I'm playing, you know, um, in a closed guard or, or even uh, even a knee shield or Z guard. So – No. And <laughs> nope, not normal. I feel like my classes are just good for sparring. Uh, 
so I, you know, I don't know. Like it, it depends. I don't know your class, so it would be hard to say. But if you're going into class and they're only rolling all the time, that sucks because you're never getting a chance to learn techniques. Um, gosh, man. I mean, there's a time for just rolling classes. I don't. I don't know. I don't even know how to answer that class. What, what was the question rephrased as? That was the basically like, like they're just concerned. Yeah. Guys, here's um here's a thing to ask you or ask or just to throw out there to you. Like your coach is in a position to serve you. That's what they're there for. You pay money, they serve you. There's a sign of re- there's respect there because you respect their abilities and what they have to offer you, but at, at the end of the day, like I talked to a guy one time I was doing like a call with him uh, to help him out with his his gym. And he was asking me questions on how, you know how to be a good coach or whatever. And one of the things I worded to him I was like, "Man, you're in customer service. You're in the service industry." And he didn't like that. You know, he didn't like hearing it like that, but I mean like to me that's what I think about it. Like to me it's like how can I give 100%? How can I help out these people as much as possible? And my students will come up to me and ask me questions. Um, like, hey, Chewy, why do we do this? Or, hey, Chewy, can we do this? Like, they'll, they'll request things. And then I take that. I'm like, well, if I get enough people that are interested in this, well, let's do it, you know? So my thing is, is with your coach, don't be afraid to come up and ask him. Like, hey, man, um, I don't feel like I'm learning a whole lot. Is there anything that you would recommend? Is there a particular class time you would recommend me to come to? Um, or maybe they can just, like, if you say something to them, maybe it'll kind of bring them down. Like, oh, maybe we should be doing a little more technique from time to time, you know? So... Feel free to communicate with them, talk to them, ask them questions, and again, come to them from a place of like, "Hey, I really want to learn from you," which is what. So I'm here, you know, and then ask them their question. You know, don't be afraid to do that. That's what they're there for. Ain't that right, Eugene? I'm, I'm watching us on uh, on the YouTube live. My wife said, "My wife sent me a text and said, I'm gonna tell this to everybody." She said, "Your face is hidden behind the microphone," uh-huh. and then she said, "Nice moose knuckle." Oh, nice. <laughs> Thanks, Mish. Love you. <laughs> My, mine's hidden behind our, our really fancy <laughs> box. Speaking of which, Uh-oh. Michael sent in Michael. a question. Yes. Wondering where you found that super exclusive mic stand. Oh, hello, Michael. So we got her all here. Everlast, baby. <laughs> well, this, is, <laughs> this is a piece of cardboard. That's <laughs> uh, a terrible accent. Um, she is the worst. I don't know. Who was that? Well, it was going to be a British guy. But but I don't know what happened. It turned into something else. But well, it turned into something different, and so whatever. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Amazing. That's what happens when he gets close to All right, last one. Last question. We'll last do this question. In a world where one woman looks at the questions, looking for one, the final question, would she find it? Or would it strike 11? And the last question was not asked. Um, it is long. Right? Yeah. Hi, Jen. This is from John. Um, John. I have separate times for beginners and advanced guys, but I feel I would learn a lot by rolling with advanced students. What should I do? Okay. I would assume they're a beginner. Are you not allowed to attend? So, we, we, we have this a little bit. So, if I don't know how long you've been training, John. Um, so if you want to chime in and tell us how long you've been training, if Maddie sees it, she'll let me know. Um, but I don't know how long you've been training. Here's what I would say to you. Definitely. Um, what? Well, uh, okay. So definitely, John, at some point, you know, the, um, only a couple months. Okay, cool. So I think after actually after a couple months, I think you could benefit from being in an advanced class. Like I don't let my brand new people come into the the, uh, the advanced class just because I don't want them to get overwhelmed uh, because of the the material that we mm-hmm. go over. Um, but after a while, I know that how I was, I got a lot of benefit from rolling with the higher belts, and so. You know, for me, I want to let those people do it if they want to. And so we have some, we have our classes broken up as well. Um, you know, I would just talk to your coach again, like ask them, what is it that you, they would require? Do you have to be a certain belt? Um, if not, you know, whatever, if, if it's just like, because, because I had a couple of my guys come up to me and say, Hey, Chewy, can I, when do you think I'll be ready for the seven o'clock or our, our advanced class? I was like, dude, you're, you're ready now. Come on over. And he goes, Oh, I just did. I, I assumed I couldn't do it. You know? So again, talk to him and ask him, see what they require. If they require that you have to be a certain belt, maybe, maybe you have to get your blue belt. Just do it. Like, again, it, I, I mean, it, it's not normal, right? Everywhere it's, it's, it's different in every gym, but just. Just do it. Like, go out there and get your blue belt. Follow your coaches. He, he probably has some system set up. So, 
follow along with it. Honestly, the fact that you have a beginner class and an advanced class separated, that's a good sign, yeah. to be honest with you, because we just got done talking to one guy who's not getting any instruction, and then you're getting the instruction you need. So be happy that you have that distinction with your classes, because you're probably getting fed the material that you need to be getting at that point in your game, which will allow you to set a, f- a good foundation for later on. But again, just talk to your coach. Boom. Um, that's awesome. All right. Yeah, uh, Chewy, <clears throat> as always, um, if you guys have questions for Chewy, where can they find you? Obviously, everybody knows where to God, find you. Can just find- Honestly, guys, if, if you want to ask me a question, um, best place to do it is typically Facebook, Instagram. Um, the YouTube comments, I go through them and I try to find the good ones. Um, but if you want to ask a direct question, Twitter... Instagram and YouTube or Facebook are typically the ones where I get the, I, I get some of the questions. I'll go through YouTube as well and try to find them when I can. Um, but if you want to ask a kind of a longer question, sometimes you can do it that way. Um, if not, put them down in the comments below, and I go through the, the videos and I look for them. I mean, you can ask them wherever. Really, I, I'm trying to make it like there's some specific place, but there's not. Just go wherever. Um, but what? Oh, yep. Yeah. Um. This podcast is the Jiu Jitsu Therapist Podcast. It's on iTunes, Stitcher, um, and Jiu Jitsu Therapist.com. Yeah. Also, guys, if you uh, if you liked this, because again, um, this was just we just threw this together like last minute. So if you guys enjoyed this and you kind of enjoyed the 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 live thing, um, let me know and we'll spruce this thing up a little bit. Because like I said, this is like literally like last night we were sitting t- texting and we knew we were, we were going to do another podcast and we were like, hey, let's do live. Um, and so we can hook up the DSLR and get some stuff hooked up next time so that you can hear the sound quality better. But if you guys are interested um, in doing that more, just uh, put some comments down below. Let us know you liked it. Give us some thumbs up or whatever. Just let us know so we know to continue to do it. Um, you know, because obviously if we get crickets, we'll be like, eh, we'll back off a little bit. So um, I guess with that said, guys, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight or in the morning, wherever you're at, depending on, because I know we got people from all over. And uh, yeah, more, uh, there's more podcasts on jujitsutherapist.com, like I said, uh, injury prevention videos. If you want to check those out, if you guys have questions for me, send them wherever. I'm not like picky like Chewy. Send them to me here. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, thank you all for checking out the podcast, and we will see you next time. Thank you.